Good afternoon and welcome to Forest Glen Park here for today's game between the Huntington University Foresters and the Spring Arbor University Cougars. My name is Aaron Failer and I'm here with Bray Snyder and we'll be providing some commentary for today's game. Now yesterday's two teams faced off for a doubleheader. Today's only one game, one nine inning game. And Bray, why don't you tell us what happened yesterday? Yeah, well yesterday the weather was a little better than it was looking like it might be today. Things didn't go as well for the Foresters in the latter innings. Something the Foresters have really been struggling with this season has been closing the last few innings in nine inning games. Foresters doing better in seven inning games. Andrew. Yeah, that is one new a rule change from last year to this year. Typically, NAIA baseball would have double headers being two seven inning games, and now this year it is one seven inning game and one nine inning game. Usually, if it was just one game, it would be a nine inning, and that's what it is today. So we'll see a full major league length game today. And yesterday, as uh, as Bray mentioned, these two teams split. Huntington came out, got the jump on early, got the first win, and Spring Arbor had an impressive come from behind win in the second game and here we're gonna see James Hall number nine from Spring Arbor starting this one off will be foul ball back in the woods here at Forest Glen DJ Moore on the mound for the Foresters James Hall batting 400 on 40 at bats on the season 16 home runs Yeah, James Hall is the DH here for the Cougars today, and usually we don't see a DH in the leadoff spot, but it's not the most uncommon thing, but usually, especially you know, in the, in the minors and the majors, you see the DH hitting more in that four hole because that's the usually that best hitter that you're going to put in for the pitcher. We're going to see a ball just outside. Count is now two and one. Right down the middle, looks like it was just a little bit low for the umpire's liking in that one. Now 3-1, James Hall sitting pretty here with his count. We'll see a strike there. They able to walk it up the strike zone a little bit. Now we have full count. See some contact there up the middle. And Adam Roser is going to get the put out there. Adam Roser over to Shea Beecham at first. It'll be one up and one down here so far for the Foresters. Foresters starting right as they know they have to. Certainly interesting yesterday's game. Uh, not something that we usually see with the Foresters, but Spring Arbor, I mean, coming back in the eighth inning, putting four runs up and able to come out on top. Foresters are going to need to get to work today with some nice weather as well. It's been colder this week, Aaron. Yeah, it has been chilly earlier in the week, and it did get nicer yesterday. And we're sitting mid-60s here today. And we'll see a strike on the first pitch from DJ Moore there. But it's, again, nice weather. We're seeing more students, you know, slowly making their way to the to the ballpark today. And there we have... Uh, the batter, Chris Triplett, pulling back the bunt attempt on that one. It's going to get called for the strike anyway. And just like that, three pitches. DJ Moore rung him up for his first strikeout there. DJ Moore, only a sophomore here, but already providing a lot of great innings. Just a very impressive player so far. And uh, really this Forrester coaching staff and the Forrester faithful, very, very excited to see what he's going to do in his time as a Huntington Forrester. It's a 3.79 ERA. It's 2-1 and one on the season. Morth, one of the more experienced pitchers on the team, having pitched 19 innings. Only Tanner Wise has pitched 20. It's one inning more than him. One of the more experienced pitchers here for the Foresters. And struggling a little bit here with right fielder Tyler Reed down 2-0 in the count. And that one's going to be down in the dirt for ball three. 
not quite what you want to see after getting those first two quick outs, especially that strikeout. And really, in any game, baseball is very, very mental. It's a big team sport. And after the loss they suffered last night going into that, I believe, eighth inning with a, I think it was like a four-run cushion and ended up losing, you know, how do you respond uh, coming out of that game and into this? You know, it's a very, very tough mental state you got to be in, especially on the mound. Yeah, well, Mike Frame coaching baseball for most of his life. You know that, especially with the one night's rest for this Forrester squad coming after losing that last inning against Spring Arbor, he's going to have his guys shaped up with time to rest on it, time to get some sleep, get some food in them. And just like that, DJ Moore doing a good job bringing the count back to full, fighting his way into this one. We're going to see a ground ball down to third. That's that's going to go for probably an air. Senior Andy Rozier had a tough time with that one, but good job from Tyler Reed finishing that one out. Our C number four, Connor Lindrich, Lingrich, excuse me, coming up to plate, coming up to the plate for Spring Arbor. Lingrich had a good game yesterday playing in left field. Went two for five in the second game, scored twice, hit a home run. Definitely showing why he's in that cleanup spot. Yeah, with batting average of 274 on the season with 73 at bats. Uh, he's got 16 RBI as well. Lead Spring Arbor. And DJ Moore's going to have to shake that one off, actually. Hits Connor Lingrich there with that pitch. Did a good Lingrich did a good job trying to get out of the way, but still brushed him up on the shoulder. And now seeing a situation here with two outs, the runners on first and second. It's only the second time being hit by a pitch on the season, but does lead the Spring Arbor squad with 13 walks on the season. And that's definitely something you want to see out of one of your players. You know whether they're getting lots of hits or getting walks or getting hit, reaching on airs, whatever. You know, on-base percentage is a very important part of this game. You know, it's kind of like the it's the Moneyball perspective. You know, we, if you've ever seen that movie uh, featuring Brad Pitt and the Oakland A's, and I believe their 2003 or 2004 run to the AL Championship Series, but with a new focus on you know being a lower-budget team, trying to work some analytics and some, and some statistics to their advantage. Also, congrats to the U.S. winning the World Baseball Championship this past week against Puerto Rico. Came out firing. Yeah, very, very big win there for uh, for the U.S. I believe that was a finish. That game finished 8-0, which is really impressive. Usually, the United States goes to games like or situations like that in different series like that in classics and uh, do not come out on top. So much of the MLB's talent uh, comes from. Uh, overseas, whether that's you know C Central South America, or Japan especially, uh, so those those teams and especially the Central American teams always have a strong presence and a lot of credit to the U.S. going out and getting done this time around. And that ball is just going to be a little bit high, even the count up at two and two for D.J. Moore. and second baseman Jack Driscoll. That pitch is high and away. It's now three and two. Got him swinging. Great job from DJ Moore closing that out with a strikeout. We'll be right back for the bottom half of the inning.
family has to make one of the biggest decisions of their lives. They need more than a realtor. I need a house. They need an extraordinary team of experts working day in and day out to provide service and knowledge to get the job done right. Anything short of intensity, passion, and drive is unacceptable. Introducing the Ness Brothers, an unstoppable force of realtors here to turn the biggest decision of your life into a walk in the park. In five, four, three, two, one for the music. Hello and welcome to FDN News. I'm Kelsey Cruz. Hi everyone and welcome down to Forest Glen Park. I'm Logan Hines. Hello, it's Hannah here on Forest Radio 105.5 FM WQHU. That was just brother with Need to Breathe and up next we have Hillsong with Touch the Sky. Once the flood waters go down for This program I felt like really prepared me well for what it would be like to be in the news industry. From yesterday to today, the water has certainly risen and spread. You become a one-man band by the time you graduate, which that's something that people are looking for. People who can shoot, write, and edit all their own stuff. I was definitely blessed enough to come in and, and I started calling games right away as a play-by-play -play announcer. Longley tipped. Down it in, and the Forrester is taking the second set. Taylor with a nice cutback. She'll take the hit left foot. That's it! Makes the three. And welcome back to Forest Glen Park, where the Huntington University Foresters are taking on the Spring Arbor University Cougars. So far, after the top half of the first inning, it is still 0-0. Zero to zero. Uh, Spring Arbor did a good job in sending five batters to the plate, but DJ Moore is taking care of things from the mound, getting two strikeouts there. So good showing from the sophomore pitcher so far. Did struggle a little bit, walked one, hit another. But now we're going to see Duncan Patterson taking the mound for Spring Arbor and senior Dalton Combs, number 19, uh, playing right field today at the plate. And that first ball was a foul ball out to... Uh, the trees here in Forest Glen. And that's going to be a hit down the first baseline. Dalton Combs looking to turn that into two. That's what you want to see out of your leadoff hitter there, Dalton Combs. Great job from the senior getting it done, showing some moves out of second base. Little dance to let him know. I mean, that's a nice leadoff. He's batting 3-3-3 three, three, three on the season at 54 at-bats. And again, that's exactly what we want to see. He needs some momentum coming out early in this third matchup of the weekend for the Foresters. Good early momentum for the Foresters. Yeah, and really that was a mistake by pitcher Duncan Patterson. I mean, pretty much everyone in this conference knows that uh, Dalton Combs loves to pull the ball down the right field line and really kind of struggles to hit it anywhere opposite field. So a lot, of, a lot of teams will try to pitch him away and get him to pop out on things like on a, on a pitch away that, that would go, you know, soft grounder down a third base or something into left field. But... Great job from there, uh, you know, taking advantage of what he had at the plate. Adam Roser at the plate now, batting just below Dalton Combs with a 3-2-0 batting average on 50 games. Yeah, Adam Roser, a sophomore, stepped into a starting role, filling in a really big hole at third base last year and has now moved over to shortstop. It's been a very good pickup here for the Foresters and is the younger brother of senior Andy Roser. He's going to hit a long fly out to right field. And that one is gone. Adam Roser knocking one probably about 330 feet or so over the right field wall. It's going to be a two-run shot to start things off in the bottom of the first. And still no outs for Huntington. That's exactly what you're going to see. If you're Coach Mike Frame, the rest of the Forester squad, a quick one-two a double and then running both guys in, and that's exactly what the Foresters are going to need. And that's the kind of momentum they're going to need for the rest of this game, too. We know sometimes it's hard, especially when you're going back-to-back -back on teams, coming back after a loss, especially when it's in the back half of the game after you played a good front part of the game. But, yeah, I mean, exactly what the Foresters are looking for here early. And Roser really kind of struggled to hit with power last year. He was more of a contact hitter, found himself still early in the lineup like he is now, but was much more, you know, singles and doubles. Rarely saw a home run out of him, but... That's at least the second one he's hit this week. We're going to see a strike down and away for senior Shea Beecham, the first baseman. Beecham also had a good night yesterday, hitting a home run in each game. 
And that's going to be just fouled on the left field line, but that could have been a double if it had stayed fair. Now down 0-2. Shea Beecham does have 13 strikeouts on the season. This is a spot where he kind of gets himself into where he's down in the count early. Put that one just a pot fly down the right field line. Made a tricky play there for the first baseman, but good job there from, excuse me, Alex Holly, number eight, the first baseman for the Cougars. And that'll be one out now for the Foresters. Now up for Huntington, number 34, Tyler Zimski, sophomore transfer. It's been a huge pickup for Huntington this year, really adding a lot to their success. Locked in a spot down in left field and has been a force at the plate. Yeah, with a batting average of 368 at 38 at bats, 20 total bases, one of the better hitters for this Forester squad. And he also finds himself down 0-2 now. But as you mentioned about being one of those better hitters, you know, Huntington very impressively has nine guys in their roster that, is, that are hitting over uh, 300. And leading the way is uh, senior Andy Rozier uh, with a batting average of 429. Now, granted, Rozier has only played seven, or seven games just being his eighth. So he has uh, a smaller sample size than a lot of these other guys. But still, to, to get up with what you have and Hit 429 is very, very impressive. And Tyler Zimski is going to go down string, swinging on that one. Excuse me. So that'll be two outs now. Good job from Duncan Patterson getting really beat up pretty early by the top two in the Forester lineup, but finding a way out of it now. And now up number 26, the catcher Mike Crowley, another, another senior on this Forester squad. Yeah, very loaded roster in favor of the upperclassmen for the Foresters. This is the year, we talked about this on Tuesday, but this is probably going to be a good year for the Foresters to make a run deep into the Crossroads Tournament with the amount of upperclassmen that they have that have experience under Mike Frame. Yeah, really this is one of the better teams here we've seen in a number of years. And you know, the Foresters historically are used to success. Up in our broadcasting room here in the press box, we've got a couple of shelves that are just full of uh, MCC league champions. And Mike Crowley is going to hit that one well past left the left field fence. Actually lands in the bed of a truck parked out there. Yeah, give that man a few extra points. <laughs> wow. Able Mike to hit a Crowley. long ball like that. I mean, that's, again, finding himself down in the count, able to put a nice ball out in the left field, land in the back of a pickup truck. Quick three-run advantage for the Foresters, and we're not even through one inning yet, Aaron. Yeah, three runs, two home runs. I mean, this is this is what you want to see if you are Huntington. This is how you want to start a game. It's how you want to start any game, but especially one against Spring Arbor. But as we were saying, uh, historically, the Huntington baseball team has had a lot of success. They haven't had it as much recently. They've been just on the verge of winning the conference regular, se regular season or conference league tournaments. And uh, have just coming up a little bit short. Last year, they were one game away from reaching the national tournament. We're going to see an 0-1 count here on senior Andy Rozier, who we talked about just a little bit ago, getting a start at third base today. Andy Rozier finds himself down 0-2. And that's going to be a strikeout for the senior Andy Rozier. And that will be the end of the inning. Your Foresters up 3, Spring Arbor 0. Um, when I set foot on Huntington's campus for the first time, I just knew that this was the place I was supposed to be, and that decision forever changed my life. I was a new Christian at the time, um, but I grew so much while I was at Huntington. 
I felt known and I felt valued there and the education department was just so great. In fact, I found a job before I even graduated and I believe that's because my classes at Huntington equipped me to do so. I'm fulfilling my goal of serving others through teaching and because of Huntington's impact on me, I now have that desire to pass on those values to all my students. In high school, my life felt empty in a way. I was living in a world full of temptations and distractions and I, I needed to be transformed, I guess you could say. Here at Huntington, there are many ways that I experienced that transformation. As a film major, I feel encouraged by my friends, upperclassmen, and by my professors. Other students and staff are willing to pass on their knowledge, and that inspires me to do the same towards others. My ultimate goal in life is to become a filmmaker who gives back. I want to give people that energy and passion that I feel after watching a film. I want to go out in the world and give thanks to God for the gifts he has given me, making good art. Welcome back here inside Forest Glen Park. Forrester's put on a show with a double from Dalton Combs and two home runs from sophomore Adam Rozier and senior Mike Crowley to put the Forrester's up 3-0. Now we're going to see DJ Moore back on the mound facing number 10. Actually don't have him in the lineup. We'll find out who he is in just one second for you. <laughs> Looks like it's number 10, Kyle oh, Harris. Yes, that's right. Batting 400 on the season through 45 games. Some great hitters for Spring Arbor as well here, Aaron. Not as many over top of 300, but four people batting over 400. <laughs> yeah, definitely always a good number. Now Steve Sallow and uh, Nate Satikovic, those those two with less than five games each, but... Kyle Harris has played in 20, batted in 20, and he's one of the, again, one of the best hitters on the squad. Yeah, we see a long strike there from him, just putting it just over the the wall at, and uh, down the left field line, and now he's down in the count one and two. And that one's going to be 2-2. Two, two. Good stop there from Mike Crowley. If it had passed him, it wouldn't have made any difference since it was not the third strike or because there's no runners on base right now. But that's something Mike Crowley's just done a fantastic job of in his four years at Huntington. That's going to be a strikeout there. Strikeout number three for DJ Moore. Kyle Harris goes down swinging. Next up, the brother, <laughs> Nick Harris. Nick Harris, the shortstop. Nick Harris is the older brother. He's a senior, while his brother Kyle just struck out as a sophomore. And Nick Harris also batting a little bit lower than him at 3-1-3 through 23 games. 30 total bases on the season. Played more games than his brother. Also more total bases. Batting average just below. You wonder who wins the arguments. <laughs> Two brothers going at it with each other. And that foul ball is hit almost in the exact same spot as his brother Kyle Harris. Again, just over that wall on down the left field line. Well, he's also getting a little bit of help from the wind. If he could use that and nestle that ball just inside the fence, on the, or rather the wall on the left side of the field. Yeah, the wind is blowing out pretty much to dead center. In today's game, actually, well, as I say that, it's changing. That's going to be a long hit off the right field wall and an easy stand-up, well, not quite a stand-up double, but a double for Nick Harris. Not much you can do there if you're Dalton Combs out and right. Yeah, but good work from Combs, able to get that ball into second, at least almost make it contested. Yeah. Not quite able sure. to, but it, it was not necessarily an easy double for Harris. Yeah, as I said, I thought it was going to be an easy stand-up for him, but Combs did a great job relaying that in and just a straight shot there. Bypass the cutoff man going straight to the shortstop. It looked, like he, it looked like he thought it might have been over the wall. Dropped just to his right. It looked like he wasn't exactly reading yeah. where it was going to go, but he did a good job of finding it and getting it up to second. Now we see a runner on second. No one holding him on. DJ Moore is going to fire a strike down. Right down the middle there to... Excuse me, number eight, Alex Holly, the first baseman. Or number 18, sorry. 
number eight in the batting order. That's going to be inside, a little too inside. That'll be a ball, even it up at 1-1. One, one. And that one's just going to be a shot down the left field line, but again, another one foul hitting off a tree down there. I almost thought it was going to hit the lights. Standing over left field, but not quite enough for that. That'll be one and two, and we're going to see a visit to the mound. Well, DJ Moore, as we mentioned earlier, has an ERA of 3.7. Not the greatest ERA on this team, but as an opponent, opponents are only hitting 234 against him, which is one of the best opponents' batting averages uh, of the Forrester of the Forrester pitching. Forrester pitching. So he's he's really opponents are really struggling to hit him. But unless your name is Nick Harrison, you just hit a double. But that one's going to be up. Easy out there for Mike Crowley behind the plate. That one just staying inside the net. If the wind had been in the opposite direction, it might have gotten a little better for Holly. <laughs> for sure. For sure. I always hate to do that as a as a hitter when you think you get a good cut on it, but just get a little bit too much under the ball and it goes straight up to the catcher. And great job, great awareness for Mike Crowley. In that situation, the runner can tag up on a foul ball that's caught. And immediately as Mike Crowley made that catch, he looked to second base and kept Nick Harris in check. Now two outs and an 0-1 count to number 27, the center fielder, Francisco Ondina. And as we mentioned a little bit earlier that the Foresters just missed going to the national tournament last year. This was the team that held them out. Spring Arbor came here to play in the Crossroads League Tournament. Beat them here at home to advance to the championship game for the conference, and that's what kept them out of, or kept Huntington out of a bid to the national tournament. Especially when you have a team, this team full of seniors and juniors that were there last year whenever they were held out of being able to advance. It's something that you know there's going to be a personal vendetta against this Spring Arbor team and mm -hmm. going into the rest of the Crossroads tournament. It's one thing to be an excellent junior class, not able to get there. But whenever you're in your senior year, last year to play, wanting to make a run, you know this this team is going to be willing to play. Yeah, and we're going to see a fly ball out the center. That's going to drop in for a base hit. And soft, or junior, excuse me, Jamar Weaver misplays that. And that's going to allow Ondina to get an RBI double. Nick Harris scoring all the way from second. That was a great hit from Francisco Landina. Got enough on it to put it out in the outfield where Adam Roser couldn't make a play on it, but not quite far enough that Jamar Weaver couldn't get there. Landina, like he mentioned, putting that ball just out where it needed to be. Weaver not able to get back in time. And that's going to be just foul for James Hall, the DH. And that would have been huge if that had squeezed its way into fair territory. That could have, going down the line like that, that could have been an easy RBI for him. Hall now with an 0-1 count, runner at second. Spring Arbor getting underneath the ball quite a bit today. Also, in this inning, top of the second, a lot of balls have been going out towards that left end of the field, towards the wall. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of foul balls either staying in on the wrong side of the line or going over the net here out of the trees. But DJ Moore now working with the 0-2 count. 
A nice breaking ball right back at the pitcher. Good job there from DJ Moore. Good play. And good put out there from Shea Beecham. So after one and a half, Forrester's up three to one. We'll be right back. It's just an incredible feeling to know that you are handing these folks the keys to a life-changing house. It's not, it's not just a house. It's not just walls and windows. It's a home that they get to bring up their family in, bring up their kids in, and show their kids what it means to get out of poverty and to make a better life for themselves. My name is Casey Cole Morgan. I'm the executive director at Huntington County Habitat for Humanity. We are a construction company. We are a mortgage company. We are a financial institution. We are advocates for families. We are a budgeting center. And on top of it, uh, we are also a retail store. So we, have, we wear a lot of hats as an organization. Um, our main focus is to serve the community any way we can. And so we want to help families em empower themselves and, and, and find a better life uh, through, through the process of home ownership. The, the need is so great. And that doesn't just mean families. And welcome back here inside Forest Glen Park. If you're just joining us, your Huntington University Foresters are up 3-1 over the Spring Arbor University Cougars. And coming up to the plate here is number 33, Will Corson Carr. Again, if you're just joining us, I'm Aaron Failer. I'm joined here with Bray Snyder up in the press box calling this game for you today. The young ones and the old ones. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm a senior on my way out here with FDN Sports. Only probably a few more games left in my career with Bray Snyder, a freshman. Got a bright career ahead of him when it comes to broadcasting. Just getting started. <laughs> We're going to see Carr ground out to the second baseman. Corson Carr is another transfer on this Forrester squad. Also pitches. It's kind of interesting to see him in the DH spot today. Most of the pitchers pitch and only pitch, but he's one of the exceptions to that rule. And now we're going to see number five, Dylan Henricks, coming up for the Foresters, playing a second base today. We're going to see a strike there on the outside corner of the plate. And Dylan Henricks struggled a little bit, has struggled a little bit so far this year, only hitting 167 with 15 strikeouts. Definitely not something he's wanted to see or would normally expect to see. He's been a consistent starter here for the Forester. Started came in as a freshman, filling in a hole at third base before moving over to second that year. And has been playing middle infield ever since. And he's going to get a hit down the right field line, and that's going to drop in. And he's looking at a double there. Yeah, stand-up double there, unfortunately. Yeah, Reed the not right. able to get out there in time. Yeah, the right fielder, Tyler Reed, made a dive on it. Great effort from him, but just was not quite able to get his glove to the ball. And that's another good start for the Foresters. Started off last inning with a double from Dalton Combs, and now we're seeing one from fellow senior Dylan Hendricks. And as we were talking about how we struggled at the plate, I think he just kind of shut me up right there. <laughs> Well, Patterson with a 5-3-4 ERA on the season. He's 1-4 through five games played. Not one of the strongest pitchers here. And Jamar Weaver, great job with the sack bunt. Getting Dylan Hendricks over to third base. Unfortunately, that's a part of the game. Sometimes you've got to make that for your team. But Jamar Weaver, always ready to do that when, when called upon. Another consistent starter here. He's a junior, been starting all three years. Played second base his first two years and has now seen time at second base and center field. So showing his versatility for the Foresters and done a great job uh, at the plate this year as well. And that's going to bring us back up to the top with the right fielder, senior Dalton Combs. As we talked about, Earlier, a lot of teams like to pitch Dalton Combs away, try to get him to go opposite field. And in the last at bat, Patterson left one out in the middle of the plate, which Combs took advantage of and put it into right field. This is 
or down right down the line. Now we see Patterson with two pitches. He is two and zero, oh, but he's putting locating them a lot better. Trying to get Combs to pop up. Yeah, he's trying to lead Combs to the outside of the plate. Combs settling in and waiting for one with one in scoring position and two outs. Yeah, that's a strike. Really a good hold there from him. No, don't need to swing right away on a 2-0 count, but now the count is 2-1. And really, even if he does just hit a pop-up to somewhere in the outfield that would you know, constitute an easy out, it's going to be easy for Dylan Hendricks to tag up and score on that. So any way that Combs can bring in a run here, he's going to come out and do his job. Now he's seen four pitches, hasn't swung at any of them, sitting at 3-1, which is really, that's an ideal count for a hitter, Bray. That's where you want to be. Because you know the, the pitcher's got to give you something. He's got to give you a strike. He can't really dance around the plate too much. He's got to locate well. And that one's going to be left in the dirt for a walk. Not exactly what Patterson was looking for, obviously. Put himself at the disadvantage early in the at-bat. It's going to lead two on base for the Foresters. And again, three hits to four hits in favor of the Foresters. Enjoying a 3-1 lead at the moment. Two outs in the inning. This is this is time for them to maybe get one more run up on the board just to keep that three-run distance that they enjoyed after the first inning. Yeah, and Adam Roser coming up with already home run and two RBIs on the day. He's exactly the guy you want up with two runners on. We're going to see Dalton Combs start to fake the steal there. Going to first. That's something we see a lot of teams do is with the runners in the corners trying to advance the guy to second and maybe sneak the guy into home if the catcher decides to throw down. Adam Rosier sitting with a 1 1 count. Rosier with a 440 slugging percentage. Roser. Yeah, again, Roser has been a fantastic hitter. And there we are going to see Dalton Comas find his way to second base and Dylan Hendricks making sure he does not get caught sleeping down there. Yeah, Harris just wanted to make sure that Hendricks didn't make a run at the plate. Doesn't matter. Not two, sc two runners to score a position. That really helps out Adam Roser because if he hits one in the infield, Spring Arbor has to go to first for the force out. They can try to go home and stop the run, but they're going to have to tag Hendricks at the plate. And it eliminates the double, eliminates the double play possibility too. Now sitting at three and one again, Patterson is struggling to find the strike zone. Yeah, Adam Roser thought that was a little bit outside, and honestly, I thought so too. But it seemed like most people here inside yeah. Forest Glen Park thought the same thing. See the see the, the cries of the fans <laughs> yeah. disagreeing with that call. But regardless, Adam Roser now up with a three-two count, one out or two out. Excuse me. Doing a good job fighting that one off. Yeah, crucial moment now for Patterson. Would not be advantageous if he was to leave anything after Roser to to get his bat on. I mean, here, again, what you're talking about is a quick play to first ends the inning, but if he's able to make contact like he did earlier, uh, it would not be great for, <laughs> for Spring Arbor. Yeah, really, he just needs to put this one in play and make sure that it can't be an, there can't be an easy play made on it with two outs. That's going to be another fly ball out into right field. And that one, again, is gone. Adam Roser, two for two on the day with two home runs. RBIs are now up to five on the day. Adam Roser, you just can't pitch this guy anymore. Well, and with that, Huntington's batting average over 500 for the day. So far, they have just come out on fire, having none of the pitching from Patterson. Patterson's done all right in second inning until that moment. And that's exactly what we were talking about, full count. Two outs, able to put that ball almost in the exact same position as his first at bat. Yeah, and really that's what, that's, you see the dividends of not being able to locate the strike zone with, I mean, Dylan Hendricks got on there with 
uh, with a nice double, but then with Combs being walked, that left two guys on. You know, even if he doesn't walk him, that's you, know, you got to find a way to. If if you know if, if you're pitching and you're and you're throwing strikes and guys are hitting the ball and they're just hitting the gaps, you know that happens. That's part of the game. But you know, as a pitcher, you really need to be able to find the strike zone and give your team a chance when you're when you're struggling and you can't get guys. You're not helping your team out. Just giving them freebies to first base. It doesn't help anything. And now Shea beats him up with an 0-1 count. Took a first pitch strike. Well, and also those last three at bats for Patterson. He got himself down early in the count. Then had to make it up by finding the box each attempt. Yeah, and more often than not, that just means throwing it down the middle and hoping for the best. Mm -hmm. And in that instance, did not the best worked out for Adam Roser <laughs> and and not for Patterson. Shea Beecham fouled off that second pitch. Now he's in an 0-2. Got to be careful, protect the plate here. Good job holding off on that one down in the dirt. And a line drive out to left field, and that's no doubt about that one. That's another shot. Fourth home run on the day for the Foresters. Shea Beecham putting his mark on this game. And that one's probably the farthest one we've seen as well. Just the power behind that one. That one flew. I mean, that's an absolute shot. We don't have a marker out there to show us how deep it is, but I mean, my guess would be the fence is probably about 340, 350 out there, and he put another good 30 or 40 feet beyond that. Certainly a great first two innings. Great showing so far from the Foresters. Yeah, really surprised. I haven't seen any visits to the mound yet. Duncan Patterson clearly struggling. I would imagine pretty shaken up at this point, too. Now with Tyler Zimski up. Struck out in his first at bat. Now down 0-1 in the count. Make that 0-2. Duncan Patterson looking to find his way out of this jam. Good hold there from Tyler Zimski, not falling for that. That's another fly ball. I'm not sure about that one, though. It's going to be an easy play for the left fielder for Spring Arbor. That'll bring us to an end of two, and we'll be right back here with the third inning. FDN News is our campus news station. And we are just a new station that shines Christ's light on campus and in the Huntington community. Whether that be going to a presidential rally or talking about the meal plans on campus, um, everything we do, we do for the glory of God. With news, you have such a great opportunity to go out to hear people's stories and tell their stories and to be light and to share that light. So. My goal for FDN News is first and foremost that students would learn, that they would engage, they would learn a little bit about themselves, about communicating with others, refine their skills, and become expert storytellers for the Kingdom of Christ. The benefit to coming to Huntington and being in the Forrester Digital Network is you get hands-on experience. So we have some freshmen coming in that week one, they are taking a camera out and they are teaming up with an upperclassman and refining their skills. So by the time you graduate, you've got four years of hands-on and classroom experience. FDN is so much fun. I feel like it really is a great aspect of the school, and I'm so glad I get to be a part of it as a freshman especially. Like, it's just a great experience. You can love working a camera and be part of FDN. Um, you can love storytelling and be part of FDN. You can be a math student and be an FDN. All right, welcome back here inside Forest Glen Park. Forrester's putting on an offensive showing so far, up 7-1 to one going into this third inning. 
for just joining us. I'm Aaron Failer, and we have a special guest with us now, Jim Landrum, uh, father of sophomore Huntington pitcher Caleb Landrum, joining us as a guest here. Came on the broadcast yesterday, too. And Jim, welcome. Glad to have you back. Thank you, Aaron. I'm glad to be back. I enjoy doing this with you, with you guys. Yeah, Jim's got a lot of experience here, and we're going to see a foul ball there. Just to the plate, Mike Crowley not able to make a play there. Well, Aaron, you know, everybody has an opinion about baseball. That's the great thing. You've got time to share your opinions. And after the game last night, some of us fathers got together. And, of course, we always have it figured out, right? Mm -hmm, and, right. And we said today would be a great test for this team to just see how we come back. And, and what a great start to this game. Oh, yeah. I mean, we talked about that earlier in, the, in our broadcast about, you know, how do you, how do you come back as a team from, you know, being up and going into the last innings and giving up just, you know, back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back home runs. It's, it's really tough. On, mentally, I, I played baseball as well growing up in high school and, I mean, that's, that's really hard to, to battle with, and especially as a pitcher, I'd, I'd hate to have to face that. But, man, I mean, so far, just phenomenal job from this Forrester team. Yeah, I, I have to devote it to the, the coaching staff. I mean, Coach Frame, been at this 33 years. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been through every war. He's seen everything. Coach Abbott, uh, the other Coach Frame, uh, Coach Flick. But, again, fellas, I've often heard that good teams have good coaching leadership, great teams also have good player leadership. Yeah. And I believe we have that on this team with these seniors. Definitely. A great senior squad and great contributions from the other guys as well. A sophomore class we talked about a lot today with DJ Moore on the mound and Adam Rosier putting on a show with his two home <laughs> runs. I mean, <laughs> just a great job so far. But, you know, really I imagine these seniors probably have kind of a chip on their soldier, so, shoulder. I know last year they said the goal was to win conference. That didn't happen. And this year they're coming into seniors really with something to prove, I think. I would agree wholeheartedly. I believe as a junior class they, they felt like they uh, – to be honest, I feel like they think they underachieved a little bit, and I mm -hmm. believe they have a mission this year to overachieve as seniors, and they're off to a great start. Yeah, they definitely have something to prove here, and we're going to see – looks like a good double play ball there. Great job starting that off with Dylan Henricks over to Adam Rozier and Shea Beecham getting two outs there. One of the senior leaders you talked about right there, that's a nice play by Dylan, who's been struggling with a bit of a hand injury. His reason he's playing second base, but uh, he's doing a good job there. Yeah, yeah. he actually started out part of his freshman year playing there, started out at third base, moved over to second base when a senior came back, and uh, just has been a phenomenal job all four years. And hit, Along with him, Shea Beecham, Dalton Combs, Mike Crowley, all of them started almost every single game for four years. Really great to see that. Yeah, many people believe that, you are as good as your seniors, mm -hmm. and that bodes well for yeah, this year. Yeah, yeah. That also kind of leaves the question, you know, what happens next year? <laughs> a That's lot of guys true. leaving, but but at the same time, I think I think from from the guys we see on the bench, and, you know, sometimes you know, we saw uh, Andrew Natividad, who's had a great season so far, got uh, got benched today for Andy Roser, but, I mean, he's he's been doing a great job so far over at third. A lot of other young guys on this team just really hungry for a chance. Yeah, I would agree. I talked to Coach Frame. I know he's got some good recruits coming in, and, and obviously, as you say, we've got some people on this team right now that uh, really are looking for a chance to play, and sometimes you're just in a tough spot because you're playing behind some seniors who just, yeah. as we've talked about, are very good. Yeah, and really, it's great to see that these guys, young guys, haven't transferred out or anything. A lot of times, you'll see that with big programs. Great call. And the play from Andy Rosa there over at third is going to end that half of the frame. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Max Walker, and to most folks I may look like a mixture between George Clooney and Tom Hanks from Castaway, but in reality, I woke up this morning, poured my bowl of Fruit Loops, and went back to the grind, just like you. After you, ma'am. But now I'm here, turning my stingy bachelor pad into a world of paradise. These aren't just your grandma's antiques, these are the antiques you deserve. So go ahead and tear down that old Backstreet Boy poster and throw up one of these bad boys. Thirsty? Come on down to the watering hole and grab yourself a soda. Welcome to Antiqueology, bringing Huntington back. Being a part of the film department here at Huntington University is amazing. We have brilliant professors who are willing to teach us everything that they've known from being out in the field. First semester last year I got the opportunity to work on the department film uh, Gift of Hope where we had actual professionals in the field today come and work with Huntington students on a film. 
students here. All right, welcome back to Forest Glen Park. At the top of the third was a quick one, two, three inning for DJ Moore and his deep forcer defense. Great showing from them with the, getting a double play and then a ground out over to third base. Now we're going to see Mike Crowley taking the plate here for the Foresters. It's interesting, Jim. We were talking in a break of, in our break about how you know Duncan Patterson's still on the mound, and you know saying that if we were if we were in charge, he might not be there still. But he's really struggled today. But you know, Spring Arbor's had really consistently one of the better you know pitching, been one of the better pitching teams in the conference last year. I know they had one of the better team ERAs in conference, and even though they didn't score as many runs, that's what really propelled them uh, in Crossroads League play. And this year, it doesn't seem like it's been there. I I would agree with you. Traditionally, they've been a team that grinds out games. They play small ball. They get good pitching and good defense. Now, last night, that's another reason the power display was maybe a little bit of a surprise. But, uh, you know, there were some calls in that game last night that, that really, I think, served to fire up the Spring Arbor baseball mm -hmm. team. There was a couple of decisions that the umpires made. They felt went against them. And at that point in the game, they, they seemed a little bit dead. But I believe they got fired up and uh, might have contributed a little bit to that uh, display of power. Yeah. Yeah, again, not something we're used to seeing, but. It happens sometimes. You know, it's, it's baseball. It's Crossroads League baseball. Anything's going to happen. You bet. Mike Crowley popped out to third and his at bat, and Andy Rozier's now up 0-1. Andy's another one of those senior leaders. I'd like to talk a little bit about him. I mean, here's a kid who loves baseball. He loves the game. Uh, has, has taken a step back in his role this year so far, but he's swung the bat well. He's a team guy. He just wants to win. Mm -hmm. Nice to see him get an opportunity today and made a really good play at the end of the inning. We didn't get yeah. to talk much about that, but that's a nice play at third base. Yeah, really almost almost any play you make at third base is a good play, I think. I mean, just as fast as the ball is coming at you, the hot corner, you know, it's – I mean, you got to have a guy with quick hands over there. You know, a little more time to throw over to first, but you got to really got to get to the ball first. That's absolutely right. Spent a lot of time playing at third base myself growing up, and especially in high school. I'm not really sure why I liked it so much with balls flying at you all the time, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it, was, it was fun. It yeah. was fun. The action at third is usually hot, that's yep. for sure. In my senior year, actually, we had a new coach that you know, wanted me to play up on the cut of the grass. He's like, you know, there's a little lip there. I don't want you to you know, get caught with the ball going over your head. Just you know, get up and, you know, get it before it gets to you. And I was like, well, that's, that's really close, but okay, <laughs> we'll try it out. <laughs> I can relate to that. I played baseball for a lot of years, but I also played men's fast pitch softball okay, at yeah. a very high level. We had guys, world-class guys will throw 100 mile an hour from 46 feet. Wow. And in that game, it's a bunning running game. And right. there were times I played maybe 20 feet from the hitter. Yeah. So <laughs> it gets that's, a little tense. That's, I, I think that's just scary. If you, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Man. Well, in that game, the bases aren't very long. Yeah, that's uh, true. At 60 that's true. feet. Yep. Uh, 20 feet would only be a bunting situation, but still, as you say, uh, many times playing well in front of the bag. And Will, of course, and Carr there up one and one. We did see Andy Roser pop out over to first base. Will's another guy who is a great leader for this baseball team with the experience he's had at IU. Mm -hmm. uh, what a player and, and just a great guy and a great teammate from everything I hear. Uh, you know, you'd think somebody coming in from IU might uh, maybe not have the respect for this league, but he does, and he really is a good influence on this group. Yeah, another one of the great additions that uh, Coach Frame was able to make coming into this oh. season. Just he, We saw him pitch the other night through a great couple innings in the, in the on Tuesday, I believe, and mm -hmm. We're seeing him DH today, so really just all-around player. Not something you see too often out of someone that's strictly a pitcher also coming in to hit, but he's doing a good job of it. Oh, I would agree with you. That's something a lot of people don't know about him. He was Mr. Baseball in the state of Indiana before he went to IU, and he was not just a pitcher. Mm -hmm. At that level, they make you choose typically, right. but I know Shea Beecham's father told me that uh, when they played travel ball together that Will was a dynamite hitter, and he's coming around. Yeah, it's really, really exciting to have him part of what's going on here in Huntington. We saw him take a walk there, which brings up Dylan Hendricks. Well, we've done a good job of getting ahead in these nine-inning games, and, you know, that's a change in format this year. Right. Last year they played seven-inning games. Right. But when you got to the tournament, you went nine. And 
we still, I think, adjusting. We're still adjusting from that, uh, from a pitching standpoint. We've done a good job of getting ahead in games, but where we've struggled is in those middle innings when we had a good right. lead, uh, making those last couple innings really tense. So hopefully today G DJ can go deep again. He had a great outing, last outing for him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I mean, as a sophomore, it's great to see what he's, what he's going to be able to bring to this team in the next couple of years. And last year, yeah, I actually saw him playing a lot of left field, um, just – really out of need. He was willing to fill in a hole over there and was a great bat, too. I mean, just <laughs> a phenomenal hitter. And this year, kind of told Coach Frame, you know, I, I really you know, I came here to pitch. I want to be a pitcher. And, you know, it's, it's kind of unfortunate to see that where he doesn't want to hit as much. But, I mean, with the other guys in the lineup that are able to hit, it's, it's okay to have him just on the mound and focusing on his pitching. Yeah, that's what's been nice. Uh, we got off to a little bit of a slow start down south because you're playing teams who've played a lot of games already. But mm -hmm. uh, the hitting has really come around, obviously, today with uh, – just the power display we've put on. Yeah, I mean, four home runs. I mean, the wins helped a little bit, I think. But still, I mean, you know, that, that shot from Mache was a, a no-doubter as soon as it left the bat. And, you know, Adam Rosier's two, two we thought, okay, that's at least going to hit the wall. And then you see, oh, no, it's going further. Like, that's <laughs> just a great showing so far. And now with two outs, Duncan Patterson struggling again. He's got Jamar Weaver at the plate. One ball, no strikes, and two walks to put runners on first and second. Speaking about Adam, that's a real maturity in him as a baseball player because he's always been a good hitter. Caleb yeah. had the fortunate experience of playing a lot of travel ball with him over the years, and he's always been a good hitter. But now he's just getting that little extra power to get the ball out of the park, and mm -hmm. that's, that's a great addition. Yeah, that's one of the things I saw out of, out of him last year. Great contact hitter. found himself hitting earlier in the lineup. It was a lot of singles, the occasional double, and now that the, you know, the core is there to really put some more torque on that baseball, I mean, that's, he's, he's, he's looking good. Absolutely. <laughs> really excited about his future here. You bet. Jamar Weaver takes one high and inside. This is a typical Jamar Weaver at bat. He's taking pitches. He's going deep in the count. You know, getting at least six pitches deep is called a quality at bat. And yeah. More often than not, the team that has the most quality at bats wins the baseball game. For sure. And that's one of the things I love watching Jamar do. And that's a great hit out of him. It's a gapper, baby. D deep left center. He's bringing in two. Oh, it looks like they're going to go for three. Oh, they're going to hold up. They're going to hold up <laughs> Hendricks at third. Dylan had a head of steam up. It yeah. looked like he was coming home. Coach <laughs> yeah, Frame was, with a great call there, hold it up. Yeah, he was. He started away from home, then then held him back. But wow, I mean, great job there from Jamar Weaver. Don't see him uh, with too many big hits like that, but you know, great job coming on clutch. Yeah, that's a gapper by Jamar, and I'm really happy to see him coming on. Last year he struggled a little bit early, but as the season wore on, he got better and better, and he started earlier this year. Yeah, yeah, that's one of the things I've always kind of joked with him about is. You know, a lot of times he seems to wear the, wear the pitches. You know, he gets, gets hit a lot, gets a lot inside. Yep. And I see him after a game, like, what did you do to the pitcher this time? Like, <laughs> he's like, I don't know. I wasn't crowding the plate that much. They just they threw inside or, you know, coach told me to crowd the plate a little bit and they threw inside some more and it hit me, whatever. So he's, again, one of those team guys. It's like, you know, if, if it takes me getting hit by a pitch to get on base, that's what I'm going to do for my I team. I agree. I agree. He yeah. is a gamer. Mm -hmm. He's a true gamer. He grinds out at bats. I love his approach. And, hey, let's give Coach Thad Frame some kudos there. Yeah, yeah. You know, I love the way he coaches third base because he's aggressive. Right. He's going to make teams play. But right there, that was the right decision yeah, to hold. Yeah, that was smart. With two outs, you don't want to make your last out there at the plate. That's a smart, smart decision. Absolutely. And now, you know, bringing up Dalton Combs, too, who's another, you know, great hitter on this team. Been a great hitter for four years. Really fun watching him play. I agree. Dalton is truly a team leader and, and – Credit coach Mike Frame for putting him in the leadoff spot. He has just ignited this offense. Yeah, it was a little interesting to see him hitting first this year instead of usually where he was at was third or even fifth. Uh, but, you know, as you said, putting him in the leadoff spot, you know, great contact hitter, really starting things off, especially today with that first leadoff double he had. I mean, phenomenal job there from the senior. Hitting is infectious. And when someone gets a sharp line drive, it ignites everybody. He's done a great job of having good first at bats. Yeah, there's another one. Yeah. Really good job from him just to you know, stay there and take that. Looked like it hit off could have been his knee even. But Yeah, and here's the interesting thing. He, I believe, came into this weekend, weekend uh, leading the team in home runs, and uh, he hasn't had one yet, but <laughs> he's doing his job. He's, he's right. getting on base. He's hitting the ball hard, and he's really led the team yeah. uh, from that perspective. And, and speaking of home runs, I mean, they just – that. You know, that hit by pitch just loaded the bases for Adam Rozier, who who is two for two with two home <laughs> runs and five RBIs today. So really, I can't think of a worse situation for Spring Arbor to be in right now. This is, <laughs> it's it's not ideal for Duncan Patterson. You're definitely bringing the hot hitter to the plate. 
He's going to take that first pitch for an 0 1. Bases are juiced. This is always one of the exciting parts of a baseball game, too. You know, like you're, you've already got a great lead. You're up 8 1. And, you know, it's, at this point, it's kind of like, well, can it get any better than this? And you got got your guy at the plate right now. It's really exciting. That's a great point. And as you notice, they are trying to stay away from him. They do not want him pulling the baseball. Yeah, because as, as you said, you know, it's trying to keep him away, trying to hit opposite field maybe because, I mean, the two that he's hit have been right center. So yeah. I mean, if you give one over the plate, it's, it's probably going to go there again. Yeah, and I think that last pitch was a good call because he missed way inside, so he's mm -hmm. put that in his mind. Right. Look for him to go back outside right here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, location is such an important thing for a pitcher. And, you know, Patterson struggled with that a little bit today, but if he can figure that out, and that time was a little too outside, but the count's going to go to two and one, or three and one, excuse me. But yeah, and, you know, we spoke okay. about how with Patterson still being in the game, a lot of people think, well, has he lost his mind? Well, you know, with so many games in so many days, yeah. uh, the schedule's already jammed, and sometimes you just have to leave a guy in there, for right. better or for worse. Right. That is one of the things, you know, I always think about, you know, who has the worst kind of schedule for, for a college athlete? And you think, well, the amount of hours that any team puts into it, what they do is impressive, whether it's, you know, cross country and track, you know, basketball, baseball, it's, it's always impressive, but... When it comes down to, like, the actual in-game season, I mean, I think baseball and softball probably have it the worst with, you know, playing a lot of games and a lot of days in a row, usually doubleheaders. Yeah, so, that's a great point. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of people have talked about, well, why don't they play in the fall or why don't they split the season? But there's no easy answer. It's just yeah. Indiana and it's springtime. Right. <laughs> and that's going to be a walk to bring in Dylan Henricks and might not have been the way Adam Roser is looking to do it, but that is another RBI for him today. Oh, absolutely. Take what they give you. They can catch a line drive, but they can't stop a walk. That's true. That's true. That's one of the things we had talked about earlier with, you know, Duncan Patterson kind of hurt himself earlier with, you know, getting a couple walks, and then that's what set up uh, Roser's second home run was, you know, two walks, and then, you know, all of a sudden you you get three more runs on the board, and that's, you know, what, what are you going to do about that? You've got to be able to locate pitches. That's a great point because one of the baseball axioms is that hits very seldom beat you. Mm -hmm. The walks and the airs are what right. beat you. Because as you right. said, if he hits the home run with nobody on base, okay, it's a run. With two walks on there, it's yeah, a three-run exactly. shot. Exactly. Exactly. And that's just one of the one of the things about it. I mean, if you can – because really, I mean, anytime you're putting the ball across the plate and if, if they're hitting, you're giving your team a chance. You know, maybe they're hitting into a gap, and that's that's part of the game. And sometimes those, those games happen where the team is just – hitting every single gap, every single bat, and there's nothing you can do about it. Just keep throwing them across the plate. But if you walk them, you don't give your team a chance. And, you know, as long as they're, as long as they're putting it in play, you can give your team a chance to, you know, get a, get a ground out, get a double play, fly ball, whatever. So, Great point. We're going to see a pitching change now here. Number 24, that would be Nick Carroll, a freshman. Speaking of the infamous Logan, he is in the house. Yeah, Logan Hunt came back up to the box, filling in at our director spot. And usually, you, uh, if you watch our broadcast at all, whether it's basketball or baseball, soccer, volleyball, you see, you hear us talk a lot, talk about the games. But really, you know, the, our director is what makes it happen. You know, putting all the graphics on the screen and making the switches for the cameras. What? You know, making sure they can hear us. Is a really great, great job, and a lot of credit to Logan Hunt. Justin Coleman's done a great job this year. Just so you know, fellas. Uh Went home last night after the game. It was late. Watched the NCAAs, and then I put on the broadcast, <laughs> and I watched the entire thing before I went to bed. Great job. My hat's off to you guys. Well, thank you. We, we appreciate that. I wasn't able to be a part of that last night, but the crew that was here, I'm sure we'll, we'll pass it on to them. If we they, had a if good time. If they're not watching themselves, yeah. I'm sure there'll be a late night for you then. <laughs> it was a bit of a late night, but yeah. that's okay. Uh, I'm old, but I'm not dead yet. All right. Sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Whatever works for you, man. That's great. Yeah, again, if you're just joining us, I'm Aaron Failer. I'm here with Jim Landrum, our, our uh, guest broadcaster today, who's the father of sophomore Caleb Landrum, a pitcher, and I believe uh, mostly closing now, correct? Yeah, he's season? had okay. eight opportunities this year, and uh, all of them in closing situations, not always safe situations. He's been successful in six, but uh, a couple have gotten away, and those yep. are tough to handle, but that goes with the territory. Yeah, and that's baseball, you know. I mean, sometimes, you know, even Mariano Rivera, one of the greatest closers ever to play baseball, didn't close out games sometimes, you know, so it happens. It's it interesting happens. you bring that up because you've heard Caleb's walk-up song, right? Yeah, yep. Sandman, exactly. Mariano Rivera, that's yep. why. Coming out of left field, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's really cool. I'm actually... 
being from Ohio, it's kind of weird. I tell people I'm a Yankees fan. They're like, what, what happened to you? You know, like, well, you know, I should be an Indians fan, but, you know, especially hey, after last year. I'm with you right <laughs> now. I've been a Yankees fan my whole life, brother. All right. I knew we had it. a kindred spirit. All right. <laughs> I appreciate that. All right. And we're going to be back from the break now. Shave Beecham coming up here. The bases loaded situation and a new pitcher. Interesting about the righty lefty matchup here. Now it could favor Beecham well. Yeah, talking about another tough situation. Shea got off to a bit of a slow start this year, but once he has started hitting the ball, he's squaring it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he is crushing the baseball right now. Late in the game, the out he made was a shot to right center. Yeah. So he's really seeing the baseball right now. He's got one ball, no strikes. I think that two balls, no strikes. And really, I mean, talking about Nick Carroll coming in here, and he's a freshman. Uh, I kind of feel bad for him in this situation. I mean, really high pressure. Your, your job is to come in and get that last out, and you're facing one of the Crossroads <laughs> League's better hitters with, the, with bases loaded. I mean, it's a really, really tough spot to be in for, for Nick Carroll. Yeah, coming into today, Shea had five home runs and 21 RBIs leading the team in both categories. Yeah. And that's another ball quality at bat here, or could turn into a quality plate appearance for <laughs> for Shea Beecham. But that's what you want to see. Patience is, is is really key. And what we talked about again, you know, it comes back to location for the pitcher, and you know, good at bats for for your hitters. And you know, if a walk is a freebie, especially in this situation, you walk them, that's another run. It's not where you want to be in for Spring Arbor right now. Couldn't agree more. We're going to see a strike on that one, but that's quality pitch right there. Yep. Yeah. Good. A way lot to... of times, three zero is kind of just that fringe pitch the umpire gives you, but that right. was a quality pitch. Yeah. Good location, finding that outside part of the plate. Here's where it gets tougher, though. Three one. Because mm -hmm. you got to throw him a strike. You can't really pitch around him, dance around him too much in the box. I mean, you gotta you gotta give him something. No place to hide. And again, that's a walk. It's going to be. Another run for the Forcers. That's going to put it up to 10-1 with Jamar Weaver, Weaver crossing the plate now. As you said, that's such a dilemma for the pitcher because you do not want to give up another free run right there. But, wow, you don't want to groove one to a guy like Shea. So mm -hmm. I thought he made a good pitch. He just didn't get the benefit of the call right there. Not right. necessarily a bad call, right. just a borderline call. Yeah. Yeah, and then unfortunately that happens a lot with, you know, any really any sport, any any official, any officiating crew you get in. Everyone's different. You know, every, you know, the – you know, the rules say the strike zone is here to here and this wide or whatever, but, you know, every every umpire is going to interpret that differently. I've, you know, my, my days in high school, you know, sometimes you, you get a, a, an umpire that has a really tall strike zone and, and pretty narrow, or sometimes it's it's pretty wide but not very high. Like, it's, you know, everyone's different. Everyone has a different taste of what a strike is. And they're, they're all consistent, of course, but still it's always going to be a little bit different from game to game. That's a great observation because I believe many umpires, and even in the in the MLB, I believe they've taken the strike zone, which should be taller and thinner, mm -hmm. and they've made it shorter and wider. Yeah, they've kind of turned it on its side. Yep, those outside inside quarters. I mean, that's where, I mean, that's where the arguments come from. You know, with <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> when, when guys get thrown out in the major leagues, it's you know, it's <laughs> it's arguing the call is on the outside corner. I know, I know that was outside, and <laughs> yeah, you know, all those. But well, the great yeah. Greg Maddox made a living out of throwing the ball a little bit outside, mm -hmm. getting the strike call. Throwing a little farther outside, getting a strike <laughs> call, and figuring out how far he could go. Exactly. I mean, that's that's one of the good things too. You know, in your first couple of bats, just really figuring out where, uh, you know, where the where the umpire is going to call things, and you know, figure the limits and go from there. I absolutely agree with you. That's one of the first things you have to do, as as the battery, which they used to call it, the pitcher and the catcher. They have to figure out what's his strike zone and what mm -hmm. are we getting today. Right. And Tyler Zimski now with the one and two count. Another one of the guys that you don't want to see up to the plate with bases loaded, and that's going to put it 2-2. Tyler Zimski's come in and done a great job. He's another kid who takes bad pitches. You don't see him very often swinging something way out of the zone. He makes you come to him, and he's been squaring it when he's gotten it. Mm -hmm. That's always something just so admirable, so so, uh, so much sure to see out of any player, uh, regardless of of uh, the level they're playing. I think even, you know, in the majors, you see guys swinging at bad pitches all the time. You know, so for guys to come in, you know, NAIA baseball, you think sometimes you look at these guys like, oh, you know, this is these are the guys that weren't good enough for, for Division One or Division Two or whatever. But, you know, at the same time, a lot of it's sometimes they just choose to come to a smaller school or whatever, or the talent's there, and 
you know, they, they're they they're that good at the plate. They're mature at the plate, and, you know, Zemski's showing it so far today. I agree with you. Often people do have that kind of thought process. Look at this. Good piece of hit here. Oh, that's that's really unfortunate there for the second baseman. That's going to put Shea in a rundown situation. That's going to be an easy out there for Spring Arbor. Kind of Shea Beach, Shea Beach kind of bailed him out, but that's that's okay. Yeah, Great still, inning for the Foresters. Still a run for the Foresters. And we'll be back here after the break. So Fusion Media is kind of this idea to bring broadcasting and film production together. Just doing media, but maybe not in the news field or in the radio field as broadcasting was. With Fusion Media, you're not stuck in this cookie cutter route to become a news anchor or a radio DJ. There's so much more you can do with it. Fusion Media is a way to take those everyday experiences and bring them to the students now, in the, in the moment. I would say there's so many opportunities for you guys to make an instant impact. We have HTV, we have Livestream, we have Fuse FM. Like, we're ready for you right now. It's so exciting as a freshman to be able to come in and right away be doing hands-on things, like being a part of HTV and the radio station. And for a freshman coming in, that's so exciting to be able to do those things. It's just really new. It's the newest idea that's been out. So no other school is going to offer a broadcast fusion media degree. We're the only one that does that. When you come to HU, you're able to really open your field and to be not just a reporter or not just a videographer, but to become someone who's multi-talented. So you can be on air, you can run a camera, you're kind of a one-man band sort of thing. You're really just given the chance to kind of run with ideas and to make stories and to create them interesting from the ground up. And that's a cool opportunity that you're not allowed to do anywhere else. The Global Initiatives uh, degree that we're offering is uh, seeking to equip folks who are interested in applying a, a All right, welcome back here inside Forest Glen Park where the Foresters have had a great three innings. And uh, going to the top of the fourth, they are up 12 to 1 over Spring Arbor. Really, not only is it a yeah. great day for baseball, it's a great day to be a Forester. Yeah, that's true. Not, not the greatest three innings to be a Cougar. That's, <laughs> that's true. They definitely have the work cut out for them. And we've seen DJ Moore still going strong on the mound here. It's going to be a ball outside, and that's one of the interesting things. He sat out for a, a long time with that bottom of the third inning, so it's going to be interesting to see how he comes back from that. Yeah, that's a good observation. Sometimes you can get tied over there, but uh, – I think DJ's uh, been around a long time as far as a kid who's he's, he's just a – he would be like a gym rat, I think, in baseball. Yeah. Uh, many kids that way play travel ball, play a lot of baseball. So I've got a feeling his head's still in his baseball game. Oh, for sure, for sure. And that ball is a little bit low, it looked like. Definitely across the middle of the plate, but that's going to put it 3-1. That one's going to be hit up the middle, and Dylan Hendricks. I'll tell you yeah. what, that's a fine play that's, by Dylan that's Hendricks. That's a great play. Yes, he's safe, but that's a big-time play. Yep. Yeah, I mean, obviously, unfortunately, he wasn't able to get there a little bit sooner, make the play in time, but, you know, that I mean, that saves the ball going to the outfield. That, you know, saves Jamar Weaver a little bit of running <laughs> in from he's center, but, but still, I mean, that's that just shows the range from Dylan Hendricks. That's a great play from him. Now, unfortunately, there is a runner on with no outs, but we, this happened in the last inning, and that set up a double play, so we'll see what happens here now. Another observation about this, you would think, okay, this is an easy time of the game for a pitcher, but it's really not because you have a big lead, so you need to throw strikes, mm -hmm. but yet you can't groove the baseball and right. put him back in his game either. Right, exactly. I mean, that's, that's one of the things I love about baseball. You can never really cruise. I mean, it's always, you know, you put the pedal to the metal the whole way, you know. I mean, obviously there's there's kind of courtesy rules. I mean, you get it by a certain amount of runs. Okay, you only take one base instead of two, things like that. But still from the pitching aspect, you can't let a team back into it. That's correct. See DJ check his runner over at first.
Kyle Harris now up for Spring Arbor with a one and two count. He's 0 for 1 on the day. DJ comes into this game. Uh, again, a hot pitcher. He's got a two and one record. Having a good afternoon so far. That's going to be a strikeout looking from Kyle Harris. That's not what you want to do, really. Yeah, you got to get your hacks at this point in the game. Uh, that's just a good pitch. I think mm -hmm. Kyle would disagree that it was a strike, but I believe it was just uh, painted at the knees. Yeah, and he's a sophomore, so that's probably something he's going to work on in the next couple of years as he grows older, making sure he doesn't go down swinging. That's one of the things that really kind of gets ground into your mind as <laughs> as a young kid. You know, you, you don't – if if it's – I had a coach tell me one time, I really appreciated this and, and took it with me the rest of my time in high school and everything was, you know, if if you're not sure that it was a ball, like if you have to look back – on, on strike three to see if it was a, a strike or not. You should have swung at it kind Absolutely. of deal, you know? So unless you're positive it's a ball, you need to be swinging. There's an old adage, if it's close enough to call, it's close enough to swing at. Exactly, exactly. And that's the difference in approach. Don Mattingly, one of the greatest hitters and an Indiana kid and a Yankee. All right. <laughs> one of the things he used to talk about is until I get two strikes, I'm looking for one pitch in one zone. Exactly. That makes my eyes light up. I'm exactly. going to take my hacks. Once I get two strikes... Now I'm going to protect. I'm going to yep. swing it anything close. Right, and that's where I mean that's where the great hitters come from. That mentality of you know you know what you like to hit, you can hit. I mean obviously being able to hit other parts of the plate, but I mean until you get that pitch, just you know sit back, you take a couple strikes, take some balls, to be be patient. You know that's where you know some of these guys uh, from the Foresters in the in the past I've talked to have said you know a lot of times we're kind of going with the mentality of you know the first the first pitch might be the best pitch you see, and it's like well that's true. You should probably you might be want to swing at it, but if you don't see any more pitches, then you won't see anything better. So. That's a great point you bring up because I believe one of the big differences in the hitters from last year to this year is that they're grinding out at bats. They're mm -hmm. not swinging at that first pitch. Because sometimes, let's face it, as a pitcher, Jim Cott, Hall of Famer, says best pitch in baseball is strike one. Throw the first pitch over the plate. It's been proven you're going to be more successful. So as a hitter, you're kind of playing into their hands a little bit. If you swing at their strike, mm -hmm. you have to swing at your strike. Exactly. Exactly. And really, I mean, if you swing at their strike, I mean, maybe you get a hit out of it, and if you do, a great job. But, I mean, if not, then you're making an easier out and making it a little bit easier on the pitcher. And we're going to see Adam Rose are not able to go to two there. So double play was not able to happen, and the throw a little bit behind, and Shea wasn't able to get the tag there. So now runners on first and second with one out for D.J. Moore. Yeah, that's a tough play. Uh, that's a very hit ball to Adam's right, so you're – being dragged the wrong way as you're trying to make that throw. He made a good play, and I'll tell you, Shea can scoop about anything over there yeah. at first base. Yeah, and that's one of the great things about this infield. You know, not not a lot of errors are going to happen. And if it's, I mean, Adam or excuse me, Andy Roser had one earlier in the first inning, but either even though he he bobbled the ball, kept it in front of him, didn't let it go past him into left field, and that's that's the most important thing. You know, with, with Dylan Hendricks, you know, having that play earlier, and and Adam Roser on this one, you know, they didn't get the outs, but you know, kept the damage to a minimum. And that's what sometimes is frustrating as a pitcher because you're not giving up shots. You're giving up, uh, let's call them bleeders. They're not really dribblers, but maybe bleeders. Mm -hmm. But they are uh, just in the right spot. And so you just got to keep hammering away, pounding the strike zone, and, and believe in not only yourself but your teammates. Yeah, and D.J. Moore now pounding the strike zone with an 0-2 count. Great way to come back. Over Alex Holly, yeah, for sure. This would be a huge out if you can get it here. And really sometimes this makes it a little bit harder for the pitcher because you know, you've got to pitch a certain way when you've got runners on base. But, I mean, it makes it a little bit easier for infield. You know, if if, if uh, Andy's getting it over, you know, going to his right, he can just step on third, throw over to first either way. You know, if he's getting it going to his left, he can go to, go to second, try to get a double play that way. I mean, it does make it easier on, in, on your infield in, in a situation like this, but a little bit harder on the pitcher as well. You bet. Popped him up. Yep, great job there from DJ Moore getting that, getting that out. It's a good pitch in yeah. a big situation. Yeah, and it was was an infield fly there, so it didn't really matter what happened. Adam Roser could have dropped the ball, still would have been an out. But either way, that's, that's still what you want to see from from your pitcher, DJ Moore, being able to get that out and get him to pop that one up. Yeah, they really, even though they're threatening here, they have not hit the ball hard in the entire inning. Yeah. So now we're going to see center fielder Lanzina Francisco 
get up, and he does have a run, or excuse me, he has a hit on the day. I really like our outfield positioning right now. We've been hurt in a couple of games mm -hmm. by little lefties late in the game with bleeders in the left field. Yep. You've got to bring those off-fielders in, cut off the base hits, because if, if they hit one over you to the opposite field, you tip their cap. Right. Okay? Right. That's, that's just that's, a great – That's yeah. good baseball. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Mike Crowley does an incredible job behind the plate. Mm -hmm. A play like that right there is not often – cheered it's not often recognized right but he just stopped two runners from advancing with just a nice blocked baseball mm -hmm. that's that's great catching yeah that's something he's done a, a phenomenal oh. job of in my opinion of improving on i remember the first game I, I came to freshman year i'm in the same class as a lot of these guys that you know i thought okay you know this, this crowley guy he can hit but i'm not seeing it. Well, andy roser diving stop showing the leather over at third base great job we'll, we'll talk more about mike crowley when we come back but great way to get out of that inning front of boy andy base. The Global Initiatives uh, degree that we're offering is uh, seeking to equip folks who are interested in applying a, a ministry education to uh, cross-cultural work. So somebody who's looking to uh, do holistic ministry, somebody who's looking to uh, engage in the business for transformation or business as missions model would find uh, some equipping through our Global Initiatives degree. Our Global Youth Ministries degree is designed to prepare people for leadership in youth ministry quite simply anywhere in the globe. It's for men and women who are already in youth ministry or for people who are simply preparing to leave youth ministry. One of the things I like about the pastoral leadership track is that Luke and Karen who worked on developing it consulted with church leaders so that people preparing for ministry uh, leadership in the church would have the skills and the knowledge that they need. Some of what uh, I'd want our program to be known for is, is being really clear-minded about linking our own program vision with the Lord's vision for His people and for the kingdom. What we want to do is be faithful to that which He's called us to. And some of that would, would be that we believe that the Church of Jesus Christ is going to be well served when it's populated and led by people who have stories of being reached by Christ and are now being well formed to follow him no matter what the cost. All right, and we are back inside Forest Glen. Coming off, DJ Moore struggled a little bit in that one. Infield not able to come some outs there, but Andy Roser saving the inning, flashed the leather over third base, catching the line drive. What a guy, and what a play over there. And we're talking about Mike Crowley a little bit as a catcher. Now here he is as a hitter, already a home run on the day. And as we were saying, I ended up sitting uh, at a game behind his grandparents one time and found out he was really not recruited out of high school hardly at all. And just the, the fact that he was able to come to Huntington is such a cool thing, you know, because he's been just a force for Huntington behind the plate, as we said, and at the plate as well. Yeah, and that's something about baseball that it's not always a given who's going to be good at the next level. Mm -hmm. You know, you get a seven-foot kid, okay, he's probably going to play the next level. It's incredible to me that Mike Crowley – wasn't recruited extremely heavily. Yeah. As soon as I saw him, I watched him uh, before Caleb got here two years ago. And I simply, as soon as I saw him play, I went to Coach Frame and I said, how did you get him? Yeah. He's that good. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he was first team all crossroads league as freshman year. I mean, just phenomenal player. Heard from someone else recently. He was, I think, was like runner up or maybe third place in MVP, bo MVP voting for the country last year. I mean, just as you said, just a, a great player, a great player. And we did see him pop out there, but, I mean, that's just a, a taste of what he can do. Just didn't quite get all that pitch. Well, and, and you're going to see that. I mean, you don't. no one scores 30 runs a game. So yeah. we've already put yeah. 12 on the board. We're yeah. going to make some outs. Right, for sure, for sure. Well, how about Andy? What a great play to end the last inning. We had just been talking about him and his mm -hmm. versatility, the things he can do for a baseball team. A diving play at third base. How about that? Yeah, Logan Hunt, our, our guy over here, was talking about how he, he enjoyed the, the fact that Roser got the nod over at third base today. Was, Nativity Dodd has been playing well in the field, struggled at the plate a little bit. And, you know, you mentioned as well, you know, sometimes it's good to set a guy out and make him earn a spot back. I'm a big Ohio State basketball fan. It's disappointing of years they had. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> Coach, Coach Thad Mata benched uh, Trevor Thompson for a while, who's 
became be, was the starting center, benched him for a little bit, became the starting center again when he came back. I mean, he was just got a taste of what the bench felt like and w- played much better after that situation. Well, and and the other side of that coin is you need to keep everybody on the team involved, everybody mm-hmm. feeling like they're an important piece. This gives Andy a chance to come in and, and contribute to the team, and that's very, very important. Yeah, and he's had some good putouts here already. Hasn't had the greatest day at the plate so far over two, but still, I mean, he's he's putting his mark on this game. Yeah, and he's actually been off to a pretty decent start at the plate otherwise. Uh, mm-hmm. Just hasn't uh, got it going yet today, but uh, we'll look for a line shot off his bat. Yeah, we Find did. a barrel, Andy. Yeah, yeah, we did mention that he's actually leading the team coming into this game with a batting average of 429. Uh, now that is with a smaller sample size, this is only his eighth game played, but still, when that's what you're making use of your opportunities, that's that's always shows something. You bet. Well, Andy's a kid who's always for the team. He's always cheering on the other guys. He's doing whatever it takes to help this team win baseball mm-hmm. games. Yeah, something saw a lot of him. I know he is a lot of what he's done when he's not playing is you know warming up the pitcher, bringing you know putting on the put on the mask and going out with the, with the catcher's mitt, getting guys ready over there. He's put some time in a little bit over at first base over the years, puts some time in the third base. I mean, comes into DH. I mean, he's always active with the team. He's not just kind of sitting on the bench by himself. I mean, he's always up on the fence, always you know chasing foul balls, you know bringing them back out to the umpire. I mean, he's always involved with making this baseball team better. There we go, the other way. Oh, that That's one, that it. One's, yeah, that one's going to get through. I'm not sure if that'll go for a hit or an error. Hopefully for him it's a hit. But Yeah, i got to believe that's a base hit. I mean, it's opposite side. The guy dives to the ball. That's, that's a tough play. Yeah, for sure. And I agree with what you were saying about Andy. I mean, he's very, very important. There's a lot of young pitchers on this team, and Andy does a great job. I know Caleb speaks very highly of him and, and, and the, uh, just the wisdom he can impart to young pitchers. And we're going to get to see T.J. Linster in number four. Another senior coming in, getting the uh, the nod to pinch hit for Will Corson Carr. TJ's another kid who hasn't got a lot of plate opportunities this year, but he's off to a good start. Mm-hmm. Another one of those interesting cases where he really he was recruited as a freshman uh, to to be a catcher, and you know when Mike Crowley kind of emerged as you know the guy, uh, he <laughs> it was pretty obvious he wasn't going to get to be behind the plate too much, and he was able to hit so well that you know coach had coach Frame had to find a way to get him in the lineup. Played a lot of outfield his first couple of years. Uh, because you know they already had a guy that was DH and they needed to get him get his bat in the lineup, and he's been a great hitter for four years. You just gave me a piece of information I did not have. I did not know he was recruited as a catcher. That's interesting with his speed. Mm-hmm. I was kind of surprised too. Just his build is not quite as stocky as some of the other guys, but I mean he's, yeah, I mean he was the, I well actually I think two two years ago I had a friend that walked on for the, for a year and asked I asked him kind of what the death start was at catching and he said <laughs> this is Lucas Handy I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name or not but <laughs> yes, he said I well am. he's like well it goes uh Mike Crowley and then uh then it'd be Roser then TJ even though he's <laughs> always plays uh outfield and that's a fair ball all right that's gonna be an easy double for him TJ Lindstrand Andy and TJ, a couple seniors coming off the bench to contribute in a big way here. Yeah, Andy's going to be held up at third base, and that's how you want to start out, though. I mean, one out, guys on second and third. But, yeah, as we were saying, my friend Lucas talked about how he walked on his, his year. The, the, depth, the depth chart was, you know, TJ, who never has caught a game at Huntington, and, and then it was Lucas <laughs> in the, four, the fourth guy spot. But, <laughs> but still, yeah, he, I'm sure he's if he stuck on behind the plate if he needed to. He'd be a little rusty, but he'd be able to do the job if he was, if he was called upon. Oh, you bet. You bet. And it's just good to see these guys out here. I'll tell you, both TJ and Andy have some power for mm-hmm. guys coming off the bench as well. Yes, one I was a little surprised to see that one stay fair, but great job for him. Another another extra base hit today. Just keep the parade rolling. Mm-hmm. Dylan, Henry, Dylan Hendricks uh, just gets a piece of that one, tips it back to the net. He's down 0-1. Dylan's had a good series. He's contributed in many ways. Mm-hmm. Again, one of those guys that you know was really labeled as a middle infielder, but as I mentioned earlier, his freshman year played probably a good third of the season over at third base, showing his versatility before he moved over to second for then-senior Mark Bauer to come back in and take his job back at uh, third. We love to see that, a guy who's willing to do whatever it takes to make the team successful. Mm -hmm. It's kind of the leadership that's going to carry this team a long way. And 
Hendricks will foul that one off too. It'd be down 0-2, but again, this is another good at bat. I mean, doesn't have any balls on the count yet, but I mean, still he's fighting in there trying to find something he likes. Like to see him grind out at bats at any point in the game. And uh, as a reminder, it's uh, 12 hits, nine, excuse me, 12 runs, nine hits, yeah. zero errors for the Foresters, one run, six hits, and one error for the Cougars. Yeah, that's something that's interesting. You know, there's a lot more runs than there are hits right now, but still, I mean, timely hitting is important. You know, we talk about those walks, and that's going to be a base hit for Dylan Hendricks. That's going to bring in two runs. Oh, not make that one now. Got a quick lead right quick relay <laughs> into third base there. Good job from TJ. Not getting caught. Nice job by Coach Thad Frame being up the line there because TJ yep. had a full head of steam yep. coming around third, but Thad being up the line and positioned properly allowed him to hold the runner. Yeah, TJ came into that ready to score. Thought, and really, I, I thought he looked like he was going to, but great, uh, great job there from the left fielder to get that ball in quickly. Things just keep getting better if you're a Forester. We see Jamar Weaver come back up. He had a double on his last at bat. I anticipate we're going to see another good quality at bat here from him. Jamar started the year off slowly, but he's certainly been picking it up and is having a very good series at the plate. We did see that Spring Arbor is warming up a guy in their bullpen. We'll see if a pitching change is made here in this inning or if they wait until the fifth. But they do have some another arm up and active. We'll see what that what comes of that. Yeah, this is the point. If you get another couple innings along where they start looking for a position player just to kind of save your bullpen and your pitchers from some innings. Because, yeah. uh, again, uh, too late to give up on the game at this point. But, or, excuse me, too early. Mm -hmm. But at some point, uh, you want to save your pitching staff a little bit because the series, I know the Foresters uh, have another game on Monday already. So. Yeah. Matter of fact, I believe it's a doubleheader. Yeah, most of these league games are doubleheaders. It's kind of interesting to see that this one's only one nine-inning game today, but might be part of the rule changes with playing more nine-inning games this year. Yeah, I think what happened there was the weather was supposed to be bad today. It would have been a doubleheader today and a oh, single okay. game yesterday, but okay. they flip-flopped. Showing some good anticipation of uh, yeah. Well, hey, this weather, you got to take what you can get. Right, right. And it has been it's been pretty warm today in the mid 60s. A little is cloudy, but so far no rain and great day for baseball. Yeah, for March in Indiana, we'll oh, take yeah, it for sure. We had some 32 degree weather in Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I heard. And last week was not always ideal. <laughs> no. Good hold there from Jamar Weaver, working the count of three and one. Typical Jamar Weaver at bat. Mm -hmm. Work the pitcher, find something you can handle, and punish it. That's what we did his last time up, put one out into left center, and we'll see what he can do with this one. Yeah, that was a bit of a frozen rope. He's going to work his way to a walk that time, and that will load the bases. Jamar Weaver at first, Dylan Hendricks at second, and TJ Lindstrom over at third. And that's going to bring up big Dalton Combs. We'll see what he can do with the bases loaded in this situation. I think we're going to have a pitching change here. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to see a trip to the mound. It looks like we're going to have – oh, that was, excuse me, that was the first baseman walking over. thought we had our new pitcher, but – Oh, this might just be a conversation, see how things are going. That could be. I uh, yeah. He may be saying, look, uh, you're going to have to take one for the team here. Yeah. Get us a few innings. Yeah, so Nick Carroll staying on the mound for now. And really kind of interesting to see. I mean, he's not even listed as a pitcher. He's an out says he's outfielder and first baseman. But you know, a lot of these guys are pretty versatile. When you really when you get to this level, I'm pretty, pretty much – Almost every guy on any team has pitched at some point in his life. I mean, yeah. Well, and that's exactly what we said earlier. Mm -hmm. They may be going to some guys who maybe don't get a lot of innings for them, but right. they just need to find a way to fill innings because, as we talked about earlier, there is no run rule exactly. in high baseball. Exactly. We play like big boys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes that's fun, and sometimes it's not. Yeah, especially what depends which end you are. I mean, in this, exactly. in this case, Huntington's enjoying it, and Spring Arbor not so much. But 
that happens. But you know, really credit to credit to Nick Carroll. I mean, it looks like he's going to get himself an out here. It's going to give up a run with a tag from from T.J. Lindstrom. So good job uh, bringing in a run from Dalton Combs. That's going to put us at two outs. But really, Nick Carroll's come in and he, he's walked some guys, given up some hits, given up some runs. But I mean, he, he's he's been throwing strikes and guys have been hitting it. But at the same time, I and mean, he's he's eating innings right now, as you said. Yeah, and that's a productive out from Dalton Combs. Just a great hitter. Just one of, uh, for my money, one of the best hitters on this baseball team. Yeah. He hits for power. Uh, he's, again, hitting out of the leadoff slot. And that's a that's about a 385-foot uh, sacrifice fly right yeah. there. So yeah. that's for real. Right. I mean, really, most other parts of the park, that's going to be another home run for him. Oh, you bet. If he pulls that ball 10, 12 feet, it's yep. a home run. Yep. It's one of the interesting parts about Forest Glen. It's not a very uh, symmetrical ballpark going around the outfield. I mean, 305 down the right field line, 320 down left, and uh, 400 in dead center. Yeah, you definitely want to be a left-handed hitter here. It's yeah. uh, a little controversial as whether that's actually 305 even dead right field line, I think. But oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Might say it to make it look better. But <laughs> well, but, but, you know, hey, you've got the Green Monster in uh, Boston, yep. uh, short yeah. porch, I mean, short porch Yankee Stadium. Yep. In my mind, it just adds character. Yeah, and we're going to see Dylan Hendricks make an easy way home on that pass ball. Oh. Jamar Weaver will advance to second. And, and we could talk just a little bit about this venue. I mean, I'm sure you have, but what a great, just a beautiful place to play for baseball. For sure, for sure. It, it's very unique, uh, not only in the state, but in the country. Mm -hmm. Just the kind of amphitheater setting, and now with the beautiful stadium seating we've yeah. got in the press box, ah, it doesn't get any better than uh, it's, it? Yeah, it's really nice. I and mean, if you're not familiar with Forest Glen, you're watching the day just a couple years ago. Uh, a don some donors came together to uh, provide a $700,000 renovation to Forest Glen Park, which was already one of the better stadiums in the conference. And now it's, uh, I would say, easily the best. And, and not only the conference, but as you said, uh, Jim, the country. So now we're going to go to a break. That'll bring us at the end of four. Forrester's up 15 to one. The alumni office at Huntington University is really here to stay in touch with the alumni and graduates as well as provide resources to them so they can reconnect. It's just really important to us that we keep in touch with them and then let them know what's going on on campus as well. Things that they might want to continue to stay involved with or maybe participate in an alumni gathering. I started getting involved as an alumni board member and we would do various projects throughout the university throughout the year. Just being able to meet people who graduated and to listen to their stories about the university back then, the college, and how it's grown today, it just, it's really an honor and a privilege to be a forester. I knew that this was going to be the university that I was going to graduate from. And I have friends here that will be lifelong. We have a lot of people that ask us, what does DMA mean? That's a really good question. Um, More than just you know the study of film or animation. DMA is uh, digital media art. All right, welcome back inside Forest Glen. As we just talked about, one of the nicest uh, NAIA stadiums, not only in the league but probably in the country. Obviously, I haven't been to really many others except from the co the, the Crossroads League ones. But not many schools this size are going to put the amount of money that they've the Huntington is put into this field. I and mean, really just, as you talked about a little bit ago, Jim, just great location being kind of down, um, I mean, really in a, in a glen. I mean, that's where the name comes from, but just the trees surrounding it, great uh, great situation to be in here for the Foresters. Yeah, it's a show place for the uh, university. They utilize this in the summertime, bring travel baseball teams in, mm -hmm. and uh, give kids a chance to see the campus. Yeah, just very, very nice ballpark, and that's going to be a ball there for DJ Morales trying to, Get another punch out on the day, but that'll put the count to one and two. I don't know if you talked about this before I got here, but you know, taking a look around the the uh, conference, the Crossroads League, you know, Taylor four and zero, oh, Mount Vernon three and one, Indiana Wesleyan three and one, mm -hmm. and uh, Goshen four and three. We're right there at two and two. So 
it, it definitely tightly packed. I mean, Taylor's 4-0, and but they've played a couple of the lower-ranking teams in the conference. Yeah. So we're right there. Yeah, and Taylor's usually one of the better teams in the conference as well. That's one of the things, excuse me, when it gets around a, around a baseball season, or basketball, excuse me, uh, you know, some of the teams are obviously clear cut better than the others. Indiana Westland's always a, a perennial power, uh, you know, two championships in the last four years. But, you know, really any team can beat any team in the conference on a given night in, in basketball. But baseball, there's a little bit more of a cutoff. It's, and it's getting better and more competitive in the last couple of years. But, uh, you know, Taylor's always up there. Mount Vernon's always up there. Huntington's always up there. Uh, Spring Arbor's always usually pretty solid. I mean, so really it's kind of a year-to-year -year thing, but still there's some of those teams that are – consistently better than others and consistently not as good but really overall the last couple of years I mean Grace has been seeing a lot of improvement same with Indiana Wesleyan uh, so I mean the conference is getting a lot more competitive yeah I would agree with you wholeheartedly and I think the one thing that maybe even makes it even more competitive just the game itself mm -hmm. typically the better team in basketball or football wins right baseball on any given day mm -hmm. any team can beat somebody else exactly DJ doing a nice job here of, of uh, just staying the course, making his pitches, mm -hmm. staying under control. Again, it's not an easy thing to do. Right, especially as we talked about with the amount of rust he's been getting in between his uh, time on the mound with the amount that the forces have been up. But that's <laughs> <laughs> Mike Crowley <laughs> makes probably the most embarrassing thing ever. Catcher can throwing, <laughs> going to throw around the horn and goes over the third baseman's head. That's all right, Mike. We'll let yep. you throw that one away. That one doesn't cost us anything. That's true. That's true. But that is the second strikeout for DJ Moore in this inning. So two outs now. And as you said, it's important, you know, not to kind of go on cruise control, but really he's cruising from the mound right oh, now. Yeah. He's doing a phenomenal job. This is second straight outing when he's been very, very good, and that's great to see. Starting off with another strike there to number 21, Tyler Reed, the first baseman. We talked about how many games we have stacking up already from weather-related uh, postponements, that type of thing. And so it's important to get a pitcher to go deep in a game, give that bullpen a rest, mm -hmm. and DJ's supplying that right now. Yeah, for sure. I know that's something Mike Fram really likes to do with his, with, his, uh, with his pitching staff is try to get guys in there. And really, unless they're getting rocked, let them go for a little bit. I know as a freshman, uh, Derek McKinney, who was a senior at the time, was a phenomenal pitcher for the Foresters. And most games I came to that he was on the mound, he was going, you know, if, if it wasn't going six, it was a bad game for him. And it went complete games really often. Yeah, it's always nice to see your guys go deep. And, and especially now when you're going nine inning games, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's definitely a, it's a, it's a change for the, the coaches, Coach Abbott and Coach Frame, in how they approach the, the pitching standpoint right. because this is a change this year. Right, because I mean, typically with the with the seven inning games, if you get a guy through five, that's pretty solid, and it's, it's kind of like the major league equivalent in a way. We're gonna see a put out there, Dylan, Dylan Hendricks. Hendricks and Shea Beecham. So that'll take us to the bottom half of the inning. We'll be right back. Chapel is important because it gives us that moment as a corporate body to come together to be unified. Uh, under one sole purpose, and that purpose being the worship of God. You know, we have many different majors, many different job responsibilities that we do here, but the one thing that we all have in common is our love and affinity for the Lord. And it's, it's, it's important because it gives us an opportunity to express that at the same time in the same location. And so there are some elements that are important to have as, as a foundation in any service. Number one is Jesus. If Jesus isn't magnified, glorified, honored, and worshiped in the any setting, then that's not the type of service that we want to uh, have demonstrated here. So Christ has to be the chief cornerstone of everything that we do in the service. It flows around, it receives its instruction from Christ. Uh, so my, my real answer is Jesus. Jesus has to be present, right? Uh, and we who facilitate, whether it's Joyful Noise, whether it's myself speaking or other speakers, I, I hope that we are being guided and led by the Holy Spirit. So, yeah, that's all I would say is good. My name is James Parker and I'm from Port Elizabeth, South Africa. I'm majoring in exercise science under the Department of Kinesiology. My name is Paris Williams and my major is Sports and Exercise Studies. 
Our department really comes in two different areas. The exercise science area, which is interested in the, the medical aspects of exercise. And the other side of the department looks at recreation. All right, welcome back here inside Forest Glen Park. We are in the top of the sixth inning. Or excuse me, this is the bottom of the fifth. My, my fault. Uh, we are here. If you're just joining us, my name is Aaron Failer. I'm a senior working with FDN Sports. I'm joined here with Jim Landrum, our guest broadcaster today, filling in for Bray Snyder for a few innings. And uh, Shea Beecham is now at the plate. Well, thanks for having me back, fellas. I really enjoy it. Uh, and what a day. Yeah, for sure. We enjoy having you. So you're welcome anytime we're up here. Shea's going to take a first pitch strike on that one down 0 1. And if, you're, if you're familiar with Forrester baseball, come to a lot of games, you'll notice uh, we've had a, a, a new uh, first base coach, Dan Wilcher, who would, would be a senior. Uh, unfortunately, as uh, blew his arm out as he described it to me earlier before the game. Uh, really, really disappointing for him. I know he was really excited about coming here as a freshman uh, when, when he came in as a middle infielder. Pretty another good, talented recruit for for Coach Frame, but still wanted to be involved with the team and has found his way as a student assistant and really done a good job down at the first baseline. I would agree wholeheartedly. I think Dan brings a whole new perspective, uh, having been a player and and could still be, uh, but yet being on the coaching staff. Uh, and Dan always has an opinion, mm -hmm. and he's usually mm -hmm. right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's a he's a fun guy to be around. He always, is. always enjoy talking to him, talking baseball with him. One of the again, a lot of, a lot of these guys on the team are just really, really nice guys. Really good, good quality people here that you know, Coach Rain's bringing bringing in. I would agree wholeheartedly. I, oh, there's a shot to right, and that's going to be just warning track power for Shea Beecham and <laughs> oh right boy, now, but you better not let him hear <laughs> you <Yeah>. say that. <laughs> Hey, left field, I think he's got a home run just about any day. But, you know, opposite field didn't quite have it in that, that at bat. But there you go. Yeah, great. Really, again, I mean, he's, he's a guy that, I mean, he swings and he makes it look easy. I mean. You bet. Uh, and a play like that really didn't look like he put much effort into it all. And it's, and it's going, you know, sailing out to the, to the warning tracks. So, I mean, that's. Yeah, a lot of guys would like to have that on yeah, warning track yeah. power opposite field. Yeah. I would like to have that, you know, same side of the field. You <laughs> bet. Uh, not opposite. But and we're going to see uh, Jake Hansen, the sophomore, getting a, a bat here. Jake's another kid, as you saw right there. He was more than willing to take that one for the team. Yeah, I thought I thought it hit him at first. But he comes in hitting 316, and again, a kid who just does what it takes to win. Mm -hmm. He will grind out at bats, as we said. He's willing to take a pitch if he needs to. Uh, I really like Jake's approach to plate. He's a hard out. Yeah, yeah, and really, he's he's a fun guy to watch too because he's he's a competitor, as you said. I mean, he plays well from from the field when he gets in and. Uh, plays does a great job hitting and you know one of the things that coach frame really values is good hitting if you if you can't hit if you really struggle he's going to pull you out put someone else in that can and last year uh you know jake was given an opportunity early on in the season and as a freshman and showed that he could hit the ball and got himself a, a pretty consistent spot in the starting lineup and he's been in and out of the lineup a little bit this year but still making most of his opportunities when he gets the chance well you're absolutely right i've, I've heard coach frame talk about jake and and he's a kid of course coach frame loves all these kids but uh, Jake's a kid, as you said, he, Coach Frame just gave him an opportunity. Didn't know what to expect. Didn't mm -hmm. think he'd really play a lot last year. And in his own words, Coach Frame said that Jake got the opportunity uh, and he earned his playing time. Yeah, for sure. And that's one of the things, I mean, you don't really, you know, sometimes you, th you think about, oh, maybe the scholarship athletes or the guys on bigger scholarships you know, are, are naturally going to get more, more time. But that's not always the case. I mean, like, you know, Coach Frame has a mentality of, you know, these guys are going to come in and they're going to earn their time, you know. And some of these guys – as good as they are, really, you almost have that presence of <laughs> you could think, oh, okay, I know how good that guy is. He's automatically going to play. But, you know, it doesn't matter how, sh how good Shea or Mike Crowley is. If someone comes up and, and really shows that they can be better, I mean, Coach Frame's going to probably play them instead. But as good as, you know, guys like Shea Beecham and Mike Crowley are, they're probably not going to see anybody taking their spot. <laughs> no, no, you're right. And, 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 of course, he makes us look good right there by grinding out a good at bat and getting a walk. Mm -hmm. And here's, here's a tidbit for you. Last year – the two guys who led the team in hit by pitches. Ah, Crowley with the base hit. That'll move Jake Hansen over to second base. Mike Crowley just continued to swing a hot bat. Mm. He started off well, and he has continued. He's been very, probably the most consistent hitter on this baseball team this season. Yeah, and we're going to see uh, junior number one Kyle Selvey come and pinch run for him. The speedster. Mm-hmm. Kyle's one of those guys that, again, is you know kind of probably chomping at the bit for a chance. You know, came and recruited good middle infielder. Uh, from what I've heard, I haven't seen him play, but uh, just 
a guy with really, really good footwork in the middle infield, good job, you know, getting those plays uh, down, down, especially, you know, being able to turn double plays. It's great, great at that. But Well, and a good player who, again, has been caught behind some upperclassmen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when you Andy with that shot to right center. Oh, wow. And that's going to bring in at least one. We'll see if he can bring in two. Look at the speed going to second base. Yep. How about Kyle that? Kyle Selby's going to get in. Got it. Yep. All right, Kyle Selby making use of his wow. pinch running, scoring all the way from first on that one. And Andy Roser, as you said, really <laughs> the big man coming with some speed, too, getting in at second base. And the, the offensive onslaught really just continues for Huntington. I mean, it's been... You mentioned earlier the difference go. maybe between a crossroads league and, and maybe D1, and I'm telling you it's a small difference because people don't understand these kids were stars in mm -hmm. high school. Yeah. These were not just average high school players. Right. Andy Rozier was another just great high school hitter. So everybody on these teams can play. Yeah, for sure. That's one of the exciting things about it. You know, maybe someone doesn't get to play as much as we talked about, you know, Kyle Selvey being stuck behind some good guys. But, I mean, when he gets a chance, he's going to be a good player, you know, and, that chance could come next year with, uh, with, with some of the guys you know, graduating. We'll see what happens. But Before all the excitement there, I started to let you know that the two guys who led the team in hit by being hit by pitches and getting on base last year were none other than Andy Rozier and uh, Jacob Hansen. There you go. Yeah, Jake Hansen, again, one of the guys that always willing to wear it. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Opposite field. Uh -oh. Off the wall. Yeah. C.J. Lindstrom's going to go for it, try to turn that into Look a at triple. This He's going to get up there easy. All day, stand up triple. Wow. The most exciting play in baseball, a stand up triple. T.J. Lindstrom not only showing the power, but, but the, the wheels. Speed. Yeah, great, great job again from the senior. And guys, I mean, this is, this is just exciting. <laughs> I mean, you're seeing all these guys that maybe aren't getting going to get as much time, but they're showing they're just as good as anybody else here in, uh, on this team or on Spring Arbor, see many other, they're showing they can play with anybody in the conference with this. I mean, this is really impressive. And let me tell you something. Here's what I like about our coaching staff and about the mentality of our team. You don't see a lot of craziness, a lot of people, you know, whooping it up and showing the other team up. They're doing this with class. Yeah. As we said, there's no run rule, so you right. have to continue to play. You right. can't ask guys not to play hard, but they're doing it in a classy way. Yeah, for sure. Because the thing about baseball is if you don't, it will come back to haunt you oh, someday. Of course. <laughs> of course. Yeah, and we did see Tice Clement, who came in to start that inning, knocked out after just a third of an inning, only getting one out. That is not going to help his ERA. And we're going to see a pitching change now. Uh, I believe this looks like number 42, Elijah Brook, a senior out of Hudson, Ohio, and Cuyahoga Valley Christian. And at this point... Uh I'm looking to pull up their roster, but at this point, I'm guessing that we're getting pretty deep in the rotation for these guys. Again, trying to save some innings for future games. Yeah, I do see Elijah Brook actually uh, is leading is the leading the team with an ERA of uh, three three point one two. Uh, so really, I mean, he shows like so only played in four games. So maybe that's part of it, but yeah, I think that's what you yeah. can see. Guys who probably haven't gotten as many innings. Uh, just giving them a chance to, you know, again, this is their chance to prove themselves, though. You come into a game like this where the Forster, Forsters are obviously hitting on all cylinders. Mm -hmm. It's an opportunity to come in and say, hey, coach, look at me. I, I had an opportunity to shut them down here. Yeah, and one thing that's interesting here, Elijah Brook, uh, opponents are hitting about two or hitting 250 against him this season. All, again, only in four games. But Nick Carroll, who also had only appeared in four games up to this point, who was the second pitcher that the Forsters faced today, uh, his opponents were only hitting 150 against him. So Whoa. really, uh, he's showing that you know, he, he's, he's got something to bring here to the mound as a freshman. And even though it's a smaller sample size for, for him compared to some of the other, other pitchers on this team, he can, he, he's got the stuff. You have to take advantage of your opportunities when they come. We're going to see Dylan Hendricks back up, to the, back up to the plate again. Wow, 18 runs, 13 hits for the mm -hmm. Foresters. And what still an zero offensive errors. display. Yep. Yeah. I always think that's one of the most impressive things, you know, when you see zero errors, and especially looking at the, the walks you give up. I mean, any time there's, there's few walks in a game is always very impressive, and D.J. Moore has, has done a good job so far. Sitting at zero on the walks today. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I noticed uh, from yesterday's two games, that in the two games combined, even though Huntington lost the second one, there were zero walks on the day, which that's always really impressive, just shows the location and the, and the control that these pitchers have. Absolutely. As we said, these guys can all play.
Dylan Hendricks, a perfect two for two on the day. And that one's going to be just foul. This reminds me of fall ball last, well, this past fall. Uh, these guys come out and they play a five-game series. They split up teams. They always pick senior captains. Mm -hmm. The winners have steak and shrimp at the banquet. The losers eat beans and weenies <laughs> and have to serve the winners. So it's quite a competitive yeah, five-game sure. series. Dylan Hendricks was on fire in last fall's series. We couldn't get him out. That's great. Yeah, I, I, I knew that. You know, fall ball was always competitive for these guys. I didn't realize what was at stake, though, but now I understand oh, yeah. why. It's a, it's a big deal to these players. And uh, the cool thing is they understand they're still teammates. But let me tell you, there's a lot of pride on the line in yeah. this series. Sometimes I think it's more fun than, you know, being able to show up on another team in the conference is, you know, being able to show up your, <laughs> you yeah. know, the, the, guy, the guys you're playing with. Absolutely. When you know you're going to, oh, and the losers have to serve the winners at the banquet right, as well. Right, right. Nice piece hit in there by Dylan, just taking it the opposite way. And again, a productive out. Yep, it does get the RBI there. And that's a good put out uh, for number two, Jack Driscoll. Uh, good job going with the ball there and making the easy play. Well, I shouldn't say easy, but, you know, staying calm, staying, staying poised, and making that play there. Another nice thing about the Forrester offense today is that we don't have anyone with three or more hits. Everybody's mm -hmm. got one or two hits, and so this has just been a very productive day up and down the lineup. Yeah, really, really exciting. I think just about everybody's reached base, too. So really, again, great job from this, for from this Forster team, whether they're getting hits getting walks, I mean, they're just, you know, really taking care of their advantages and doing doing a well, or a good job. Tomorrow Weaver here now sitting at one and one with two outs. Nobody on base. And it's a hard game to play if you're Spring Arbor. Mm -hmm. It's it's not a fun position to be in. You're in the final game of the series. Uh, you're really looking to come out here and take two out of three, and uh, it's going to be a long trip home for them. Oh, for sure. And Jamar Weaver's going to get a good bat on that one. Unfortunately, that's going to be straight to the center fielder. And that will be the third out of the inning. So we will be right back. That is 19 to 1 now for the Foresters. Welcome back here to Forest Glen Park, where your For Huntington University Foresters are up 19 to one over Spring Arbor. Really, just been uh, a wonderful offensive showing here for Huntington. And up to bat now is uh, number four Connor Lingrich for Spring Arbor, and that's going to be a first pitch strike. DJ Moore still on the mound for the. Uh, third, fourth, and fifth innings, we had Jim Landrum joining us as a guest broadcaster. Wonderful uh, having him up here in the booth. His, his son, as we mentioned, Caleb Landrum, is uh, the sophomore closer for Huntington. And now it's uh, back to myself, Aaron Failer, and Bray Snyder here uh, back on the broadcast. Yeah, it's always fun to have somebody up in the press box who knows so much about baseball and is able to communicate so well. Yeah, one time last year we were able to bring up uh, – 
uh, Huntington alum Blake Holbein, who uh, was a pitcher here for Huntington uh, in a game. I believe he stopped by for one of the league tournament games. And it was fun having him calling a couple games as well. He really enjoyed it, and a uh, really great experience for the guys up here calling that game too. It's always fun having those uh, opportunities like that to bring people in. We'll probably look to do that more uh, with Jim as the season goes on, and also if we have other alum like possibly Blake Holbein or others around, we might be able to try and bring them up for a little bit. Now we're going to see 2-2 two, two count here for Lingridge. It's going to be a pop fly. A lot of time there for TJ Lindstrom to track that one. Down. Actually, excuse me, that's going to be Jake Hansen out there in left field now. TJ subbed in as the DH, and Jake Hansen came in as the left fielder. Also another substitution, Andrew Natividad came in for Andy Roser, getting some innings here. Yeah, Jake Hansen usually plays out in right field. Get a little of the switch up today, flipping to the other end, and there have been quite a few balls that have gone over there, foul and fair. Yeah, and one more substitution, actually, Kyle Selby, who we talked about, got the was came in initially as a pinch runner, is also uh, playing at second base now, so he's getting a, little, uh, and a good opportunity here. We talked about he's one of those guys that really is really struggled to find playing time behind some of the talent that he's that there is on this team, but he's a good player and he's going to look to show show his worth here. Moore continuing to do some great work at the plate. First two innings, at least through the top of the second inning, it looked like the Foresters were going to have their work cut out for them, have to maintain distance, and they've just pulled away. <laughs> it's been an yeah, offensive showcase on the day. It's the second out now. Jack Driscoll, Driscoll struck out there, the second baseman. And really that was one that pretty sure in a bat he wish he could have had back. As soon as that pitch came across the plate, he started to walk back to the dugout knowing, knowing it was strike three. And really that's a situation you never want to be in as a hitter when you just get froze like that. He's one of only three players so far on the day uh, for Spring Arbor who has an actual hit. It just hasn't been, hasn't been the kind of game that Spring Arbor I think anticipated coming in. Maybe not even Huntington. We know Mike Frame was coming in looking to make some adjustments, but I don't even know, honestly, that he would have been able to foresee uh, what has happened today. Oh I mean, yeah. it's just been defensively, the pitching for Moore has been great so far, and the batting has just been outstanding, really, for the Foresters. Yeah, and that's going to be the second strike now uh, for DJ Moore going up against Kyle Harris. But, I mean, yeah, as, as you said, I mean, last night showed us that this is going to be a like, oh, we're going to see the third strike here, and Mike Crowley's going to get the put out at first, so that's going to be another quick end of that half inning. We'll be right back for the bottom of the sixth after this. In five, four, three, two, one. Pick up music. Hello and welcome to FDN News. I'm Kelsey Cruz. Hi everyone and welcome down to Forest Glen Park. I'm Logan Hunt. Hello, it's Hannah here on Forest Radio 105.5 FM WQHU. That was just Brother with Need to Breathe, and up next we have Hillsong with Touch the Sky. Once the floodwaters go down for This program, I felt like, really prepared me well for what it would be like to be in the news industry. From yesterday to today, the water has certainly risen and spread. You become a one-man band by the time you graduate, which that's something that people are looking for, people who can shoot, write, and edit all their own stuff. I was definitely blessed enough to come in, and, and I started calling games right away as a play-by-play -play announcer. Longley tipped. Down and in, and the Forrester is taking the second set. Mateo with a nice cutback. She'll take the hit left foot. That's in. Takes the three. That's good. <laughs> Through FDN Force, you know, it's really going to feel like uh, a professional setting. I'm, I'm looking to really just take it to the next level, really just upgrade this FDN Sports and uh, let people know that, you know, FDN Force is here to stay. We're here to battle with everyone. With radio, students definitely thrive. All right, welcome back inside Flores Glen Park. and. DJ Moore has been putting on a show from the plate. He's been doing a phenomenal job. His eight strikeouts on the day, only giving up one earned run, has no walks. That's what you want to see out of your sophomore. A very, very high ceiling for him. And now we see uh, Elijah 
Brooke still on the mound for Spring Arbor. Came in last inning. And Dalton Combs is going to be up again. This will be another at bat for him. Just interesting to see, you know, I mean, Coach Ryan Markin has left pitchers in for quite a bit. I mean, Patterson stayed in for a while, mm -hmm. and he wasn't able to get anything going. Three runs, four runs, five runs in innings, and he just stayed in. Yeah, and Duncan Patterson really struggled today for Spring Arbor. And Huntington's really able to, was really able to capitalize on the pitches they gave him. And now we're seeing Dalton comes with a 1-1 count here. And as we talked about a little bit uh, before we went to that br commercial break and a little bit on the break, you know, where did this, you know, kind of like almost where did this game come from? Because, I mean, we saw last night the offensive – uh, show between these two teams putting up a lot of runs in both games and uh, so we kind of expected that again but really DJ Moore has done a phenomenal job of shutting down the Spring, Ar Spring Arbor lineup and Huntington just came out swinging and it hasn't stopped. I mean 19 runs on 13 hits. Just a great job so far. Well and some of those have also just been some unfortunate situations. Only one wild pitch for Spring Arbor today but there are multiple times where Sallow sitting back at catcher He's had some balls just, you know, get away from him. Uh, men catch up on bases, get another one in. A lot of a lot of pitches also have led to walks, like this one here. Yeah. Uh, we had bases loaded twice off of walk, and I think we had three runs off of walks for the Foresters. And it's something whenever you're whenever you're down significantly, even if you're only down ten to one in the first three innings, you have to do a better job of of not giving up those errors and that's stuff that Spring Arbor can control, just being freely given to Huntington. Yeah, and as you mentioned, the errors, only, they only do have one error on the day, but uh, the walks have been very significant. I mean, as a team, they have uh, seven walks now um, on the game. I'm not sure what, I'm not sure if that was – well, Dalton Combs got a free pass over there. I'm guessing that was a balk that left that happen. I wasn't able to hear the ref or the official, excuse me, not in basketball season anymore. These are umpires, not referees, but – so the only only explanation for that was was a balk. Which, if you're unfamiliar with the term, it's if uh, the pitcher makes an illegal motion. He, if there's a runner on base, it's a free base, and it would be a ball if there are no runners on. That's what we're talking about. It's the unforced, not statistical errors, but just the unforced errors that are things that Spring Arbor's committing really without any pressure. I mean, of course, there's 19-1, obviously right. a fair amount of that pressure is, there. That is but a bit of pressure, you're right. I mean, it's it's like when you're down by 20 in a basketball game, if you dribble the ball off your foot, yeah, that's not pressure exactly. because of the situation. That's just something that you've got to control yourself. Right, right. Spring Arbor just, the maybe not even as so much of a collapse, just Huntington has come out with a vengeance today. Yeah, the mental game hasn't quite been there. And that's, again, something we talked about, you know, how will Huntington respond after last night being up, uh, I believe, in the eighth inning and, Going up with giving up, you know, back to back to back home runs to to end up losing that game. I believe it was ten to nine, um, and and you have your answer here. If that, if you're wondering that same question as well, Huntington's responded very very well. Came out swinging, very much so put that game behind them, and they came out ready to go today. We're also seeing uh, senior twenty three Drew McLaughlin uh, getting the opportunity to pinch hit here. One of three guys on this Foresters uh, roster from Noblesville, Indiana, just north of Indianapolis. Drew, his younger brother Dax, and TJ Lindstrom, all from Noblesville. We did talk about the uh, the errors and such earlier. Like Again, only one error for Spring Arbor, but a lot of walks. There have been seven walks in this game, and that's led to uh, a lot of runs here. A couple, a couple guys were, were just walked in on a walk happening on the bases loaded. A couple guys, you know, there were walks and then uh, guys got hit by pitch and then they were hit in later for off a big home run or a double or whatever. But again, you just, you know, these pitchers have had a really, a real struggle with hitting their locations. And McLaughlin puts that one, just kind of skyrockets that. It's going to be an easy play for Jack Driscoll there into short right field. That'll be the first out of the inning. But if you're Coach Ryan Markin, what do you do in this situation? Because we remember at the bottom of the third inning, whenever Huntington was just getting going, they got up to five runs in the third inning. What do you do? Because he left Patterson in for a while, and on top of that, you can call you can call breaks, but there's not – I mean, you know, what do you do as a coach? Because you just see the offense continue to roll and roll and pick up steam for the Foresters 
especially when you have bases loaded as often as we've had today. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's tough. Obviously, I mean, especially when you get down, you know, nine nineteen to one. Obviously, the game is is pretty out of reach. Would would uh, a comeback be totally impossible? No, but it's it's very very unlikely. Uh, excuse me, but you know, obviously in this situation, you kind of got to get your realize get your guys to realize, you know, don't just you know totally roll over and and quit on this. You know, you have to be able to come out and compete and, and finish it out. Because even if it is painful and you come out with a loss, you know, you gotta you want to keep the damage damage to as as little as possible. And if that means you know, holding the Foresters scoreless by still while still losing by 18, you know, at least for the last, you know, four innings or whatever, that's a win for Spring Arbor. But, you know, just kind of, you know, cut the bleeding off as soon as you can and, and get out of here and get back home to Spring Arbor and, and regroup for your next game. Yeah, I mean, that's the other thing. Right now it's about experience, but it's one of those things, like you mentioned, you just got to stop the bleeding. You don't want it to get out of hand to where you're more demoralized than you need to be. 19-1 is not pretty for any team, of course, but Spring Arbor, again, they're getting guys in. They're mm -hmm. they're rotating. They're getting guys experience. Same for the Foresters, and that's kind of what you need to be doing because this game won't necessarily be a make it or break it game for either team, just in and of itself. So using it to get some experience, what it's what it's more about now for Huntington is just trying to get that morale boost. Coming off an unsatisfactory game last night, and with the weather, you know we've talked about this, but it was supposed to be a doubleheader today. We thought maybe because of the rain that. We might need to reschedule so we can play this one earlier in the day, and then <laughs> no rain so far. But right. Right. We're seeing Tim Dodd foul that one off to keep his bat alive. He's now sitting at two and two. And one of the things that's really impressed me so far in this game is the Foresters have put up at least three runs in every single inning. I mean, you don't have to put up three runs in every inning, but you know, to be in a situation where you're putting up at least one, I mean, that's always really impressive. And that's always something you need to do. See if they can continue. Tibidaba with two balls, two strikes, one out on the inning. We see Elijah Brook here still on the mound. The wind up. And another foul tip for Natividad. And great job from him. That's going to be, I believe, the sixth pitch of the at bat. So quality at bat from him. Natividad is another transfer that this team has is a junior and again it would have been one of the great additions so far he didn't get the starting nod today but over at third base but he's been solid over there defensively so far as we mentioned has struggled a little bit from the plate and that's why you know Rosier likely got the nod to start things off but still another good pickup for the Foresters adding a lot of depth to this roster now it's going to be full count 3-2 from Elijah Brook For the fans, it's definitely a nice day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We did mention the sun's not quite out, but I mean, still, you know, sitting in the mid 60s. I mean, you really can't go wrong with this. Yeah, and on top of that, it's not too humid. Rain hasn't started yet. And that's gonna end the put out there from third base for Natividad, but pretty pretty solid contact though. Unfortunately, it went straight to the third baseman, and that's gonna hold Combs up at second. Now there are two outs. We're going to see Jake Hansen back up for the Foresters. Jake Hansen, we talked about him a little bit ago, of, uh, just being an all-around good guy, good good team player for this team. He was hit by a pitch earlier. Then he went on to score a run. As have most guys who have... <laughs> Seen the field today. Yeah, that's that's true. <laughs> just been one of those kind of days. Yeah, almost everyone that has come up to the plate for Huntington has, has been able to get on base and score. That's going to be a pop fly really high. Uh, should be an easy out here for the third out of this inning. And that will get Spring Arbor out of that one with no further damage. We will be right back here for the top of the seventh. Um, when I set foot on Huntington's campus for the first time, I just knew that this was the place I was supposed to be, and that decision forever changed my life. 
I was a new Christian at the time, um, but I grew so much while I was at Huntington. I felt known and I felt valued there, and the education department was just so great. In fact, I found a job before I even graduated, and I believe that's because my classes at Huntington e equipped me to do so. I'm fulfilling my goal of serving others through teaching, and because of Huntington's impact on me, I now have that desire to pass on those values to all my students. In high school, my life felt empty in a way. I was living in a world full of temptations and distractions, and I, I needed to be transformed, I guess you could say. Here at Huntington, there are many ways that I experienced that transformation. As a film major, I feel encouraged by my friends, upperclassmen, and by my professors. Other students and staff are willing to pass on their knowledge, and that inspires me to do the same towards others. My ultimate goal in life is to become a filmmaker who gives back. I want to give people that energy and passion that I feel after watching a film. I want to go out in the world and give thanks to God for the gifts he has given me, making good art and be the spark of encouragement that can transform the lives of others. I played volleyball and softball here at Huntington, and the girls I play with, I can tell that they care about me more than just an athlete. They care about me as a person, and I know the relationships I have with my teammates are friendships, and I'm going to have those for the rest of my life. And I think a huge part of that is due to the atmosphere that Huntington creates. My relationships with my professors in the education department are the exact same way. When I got my first official job offer for next year, the very first person I texted was one of my professors. My ultimate goal in life is to not only be the best teacher I can be, but to also be the best I can be. Welcome back here in Forest Glen Park where the, your Huntington University Foresters are still up 19 to one over Spring Arbor Cougars. And that last inning, the bottom of the six was the first time that the Foresters were not able to score. Now we have a couple more uh, changes here for Foresters. Now, sophomore Blake Gray is on the mound. Blake has a 5.4 ERA. He's been in five games so far this year. He's got a one and one count going up against number 14, Nick Harris, the shortstop for Spring Arbor. That's going to be a base hit for him. Some good momentum to start off the inning for Spring Arbor. Got some other changes. Andy Roser's back in the game. We're now playing first base. Shea Beecham took a seat. And number 22, Hunter, Hunter Loeskamp uh, from Milford, Ohio, uh, has come in to catch for Mike Crowley. That'll be a first first pitch strike there from Blake Gray. That'll be two strikes now going up against number 30, Emilio Perez. And Blake Gray actually has uh, eight strikeouts on the season paired with four walks. Opponents are hitting 276 against him, which is not the greatest, but that one is going to strike him out looking. Perez not too happy about that one. Didn't think he liked the call, but nonetheless, the umpire called the inside of the plate there. So that'll be the first punch out for Blake Gray, Blake Gray in today's game. Looking good. Just trying to get guys experience. Uh, that's a good hit there for 27, Francisco Odena, the Odina, excuse me, the center fielder. Just a great job hitting that gap where Roser quite wasn't able to get there because he was holding on Perez, uh, excuse me, not Perez, uh, Harris at first. So now runners on first and second. One out. And number 16, Nate. S he, he, well, he has a tough last name pronounced. <laughs> I'll, I'll just, we'll leave it there. Uh, very well, very well, what would you say? You've been kind of quiet recently. We Nate talked about this earlier. Nate Sikovitz. Sikovitz. 
Nate Sigowitz. All right, we'll go with that. He's not played too often this year, but now is two strikes. Fouled back that first one, caught that one looking. Now Blake Gray up 0-2 in the count. Good place to be for the sophomore. He's going to get a good good battle on that one. And center fielder, I believe that's still Jamar Weaver, not able to come up with the, with the catch, but good job trapping that and keeping it under him. But that's going to load the bases for Blake Gray. And it's not the situation that Coach Ray wanted to get his team in when he made the subs here, but I mean, Gray's going to put some good pitches across the plate, and Springer's been able to hit him. Yeah, I think I think what he's doing here though is he's he's recognizing that this is a game that's next week, of course, and going to be very full schedule for the Foresters. Um, with the weekend arrest, I mean, he his guys will have a little bit of time before four games in the next week, but still, just getting some younger guys out there. We've got Hanson Weaver and Combs in the outfield, still holding it down. Uh, Nativity Dodd, who didn't get the start today, but of course, a very experienced player sitting over at third. Guys, just getting some good experience today. And, of course, when you're going to join a 19-1 lead, certainly uh, not too risky. <laughs> oh, for sure. And you definitely want to get your young guys an experience like this. I mean, there's no really any point in keeping all your you know premier starters in in a game like this. But you know, still want to see those guys be able to come out and get, get the out. So we'll see what Blake Gray can work here from the mound. He's going to go down 2-1 and one in the count now. As we've said many times today, this has been a good day for Forrester baseball. This is where they're looking to see, you know, how well can these guys really close it out. That's going to be another ball, three and one now. Missed those last two in the same spot, just a little bit away. That's going to be a fly ball. It'll be the out made there by Dalton Combs. Kyle Selvia went out to make the play initially. Combs get, did a good job calling him off of there. You know, usually that's a lot of times that's going to be Selvia's ball, but you know when he's going back on it, it's a lot easier for Dalton Combs to come in and get it. And since it was in his range, that's a good call there from the senior, getting two outs now and keeping all the runners where they're at. So still two outs. Bases are loaded. And now number 21, Tyler Reed, the first baseman from Brooklyn, Michigan, and transferred out of Jackson College. He's now up the foot and now up at the plate. This is tough. Spring Arbor would like to obviously get on the board again here uh, at the top of the seventh, but base is loaded still with two outs. Just a single play can stop the run. And a little a little momentum is all that Spring Arbor really needs, just mm -hmm. one run, just right. to get a little something going. You know, obviously, they're looking for the win, but it's pretty demoralizing to have three innings left and have to make up 18 runs. This is just this is just a moment where we're going to see what they can get working. Bases loaded certainly don't hurt, of course. Yeah, and you definitely want to keep your pride in a situation like this to be able to and talk about it. There it is. That's a great base hit there from Tyler Reed. Jake Hansen has a little bit of trouble out there. It looked like he slipped, and that's going to be a double and bringing in two RBIs there. Great job from the senior Tyler Reed getting it done. Yep. Going up against the sophomore Blake Gray, finding a pitch he liked. Looks like Hanson may have just turned his ankle a little bit. Not enough to where he can't walk it off, but not looking 100% out there in left field. Yeah, I know he's, he's battled some injuries off and on in his two years here. But looks like he should be okay. And the big thing for Gray in that situation is, you know, not be too demoralized by, you know, that, that pitch. Obviously, he, he did a good job getting that first out with that strikeout and then did a good job having popping up a guy, um, popping up triplet to right field. And you really want to get your third out right away and not give up anything else. But, you know, in that situation, you know, did give up two runs, but really no damage done. I mean, still two outs, two guys on. The four, only four out is at first now but still not in a terrible situation to be in, but obviously he's going to want to come in and, and get a clean a clean run there. <coughs> that would be a strike. 
The count is now one and two. Again with two outs. And this is junior Connor Lingrich. Yeah, it just gives Gray a little more time to play around, maybe not give him something extremely easy to hit. Yeah, Lingrich, good job there holding off that pitch in the dirt. Looked like he was going to go for it initially. Now, Lingrich Jr. out of Monroe, Indiana, and Adam Central. It's actually the same high school as Dalton Combs. So these two guys would have been teammates at one point in time. Oh, that pitch looked really pretty from here, but I guess it was just a little bit outside. Counts now full, three and two. Blake Gray still working on the mound. That's going to be a walk there. Lingridge getting the easy pass over to first base, and that's actually the first walk uh, the Forrester pitching has issued the entire day. That's one of the things we talked about earlier, especially with Jim, of the importance of not giving uh, freebies. That's something that Spring Arbor really struggled with earlier. That's something uh, Pat uh, Duncan Patterson really struggled with, too. He had six walks, actually, or four, excuse me. Um, and that's what really did him in with a lot of damage, and going to make sure... Blake Gray's doing okay. The quick visit from the coaching staff and the catcher Los Camp, and just see how that does. Again, this is time for Gray to get some experience. Coach Frame obviously wanting to make sure that the lead doesn't start slipping too much. Yeah, and that's going to be. An easy fly ball there to Jamar Weaver. So good job, Blake Gray, giving him one right down the middle for him to hit. Great play from Jamar Weaver. That will take us into the bottom of the seventh here. It's just an incredible feeling to know that you are handing these folks the keys to a life-changing house. It's not, it's not just a house. It's not just walls and windows. It's a home that they get to bring up their family in, bring up their kids in, and show their kids what it means to get out of poverty and to make a better life for themselves. All right, welcome back. That was our apologies there. We thought this was going to be a nine-inning game today. Turns out it was only going to be seven, so despite giving up those two runs there, Blake Gray does come in to close out the game. A uh, great job here overall, especially from DJ Moore, putting on a very dominating performance, getting the win, and the offensive performance from this Huntington squad today was very, very impressive. Uh, I mean, Bray, final thoughts on, on today's game? I mean, we talked a lot about, you know, how are these, how are these guys going to come back, and they definitely showed that. But what's this look like going into next week? Well, I think going into the next week, first and foremost, this is just a confidence boost for the Foresters. It's never great to split, especially in the way that the Foresters did it yesterday, or rather last night. But, again, I think this is, this is that offensive showing that they have really been looking for this season. Uh, 19 runs, and this was only through seven of course, and they did not score in the six. This is something that they're, that they're going to be remembering through the rest of the season, knowing that they are able to put this kind of uh, offensive production out on the field, and again, defensively, limiting to one run through six innings. So, I mean, this is definitely something they're going to be proud of when they go home tonight. Yeah, really a fantastic outing from Huntington today in all aspects of the game, and it is final score again, 19-3 to three after seven innings. So that's definitely what the, what the doctor ordered if you're Foresters. A real excuse me, what Coach Frame ordered for his team. Uh, so really phenomenal job from them in all aspects of the game today. Uh, tough loss here for Spring Arbor. They're going to go back to Michigan and really try to close things out, figure things out. That's going to be the end of our broadcast. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Aaron Failer, and here's Bray Snyder, and uh, this is FDN Sports.